Connecting the boreal forest to the high arctic, the barren lands is a northern desert, influenced by long days, hostile weather, and a short growing season. This has produced a highly tuned ecozone that is adapted to living life on the edge. Because of its remoteness, size, and endless waterways, the barren lands has a strong reputation as being the pinnacle of wilderness canoe tripping. And over the years, our team has been dreaming of one day visiting the strange paradise. Starting in the boreal forest of Great Slave Lake, our team will attempt to cover over 800 kilometers through a self-supported crossing of the barren lands, with the final goal to reach Bathurst Inlet of the Arctic Ocean in one month. The challenges of a tight schedule and mother nature play heavy in this adventure as we travel some of the region's most iconic and isolated waterways, get into some of the most insane fishing imaginable, and experience its incredible wildlife. This is the gateway to the Arctic. Yes, sir! Man, that is so cool. He took the assignment an extra level. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, you want a buzz? How about two? Unlike other trips that we've done, this is the first time ever we're starting our trip with a portage. And this is not just any portage. This is the iconic Pikes Portage that leaves Great Slave Lake. The first section is about 4.6 kilometers with a 240 meter elevation. So right away, we're gonna get right into trip mode with this portage. And the first item on the agenda is to rebuild the boat. What was the total tonnage of our, all our gear? 670 pounds of gear, not including the canoes. Add an extra 80 pounds per canoe. Yep. A lot of the stress of planning this, getting to like the starting point with all of our gear, all of us, and safe flight, it feels amazing. It's amazing, you know, I've been in Yellowknife for four years and it's pretty flat, like maybe there's hills, little hills of like 100, 150 feet, but the when you're flying in, it, it's amazing. There's like cliffs and just real topography. You could come off and it's always such a whirlwind, like tinkering with gear and getting stuff ready and then every now and then you look up and you're like, oh yeah, this is sweet. I feel terrible. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be here at all. Just forced into it. No, I feel great. <laughs> Never been to Northwest Territories. Never been on a canoe trip longer than like five days. So it feels pretty good to be embarking on something I've never done before with 
some new folks, and my brother. My tree plant and crew boss in BC. So, yeah, that's been two months of, you know, working almost every day and a lot of time with the black flies and long hours and stuff. So I feel primed. Yeah. When, when we're huffing and puffing up the hill, he's going to be uh, uh, cruising, no problem. <laughs> I'm the worker. Nosotros vamos a ir allá. Actually, probably a strategy not to take four bear barrels and bring them over. I'm just thinking of like, it's true. It's taken a little time to figure out our portage strategy. Right off the start, we're doing this big ass portage. You know, at the start of every trip, you sort of have to figure out what you have and what goes well together. No warm up right to it. We're just getting started on this trip and already absolutely beautiful scenery around us. Blown away by the landscape out here. I didn't think it was gonna be so dramatic right off the bat. We know a lot of people back home are gonna ask, why do we not just take the float plane an extra five kilometers, get dropped off the other side of, the, of this portage? What's the significance of Pike's portage, Kyle? It's like the traditional um, route from the Great Slave Basin, which is the home of the Dene, up into the Barren Lands, which has been for a long time a traditional source of game, caribou. The caribou live in the Barrens. Uh, it's a famous portage. People have been using it for thousands of years, and a lot of great explorers over the years have, have used it, and we just thought it important to do it. Yeah, it would almost feel like cheating if we skipped this. And it'll make Artillery Lake so sweet when we get there. Yo, maybe go a little more sparing. Yeah? Don't you think? Okay. Just because you don't like mustards? Uh, no, just because I think we'll run into the bottle by tomorrow. We've made it about halfway on the portage. We've climbed a lot of elevation and the boys are getting hungry. So Noah's on lunch today, putting together a nice hearty lunch for us so that we can refuel and continue on and get to some water by the end of the day today. This is one of the OG wraps too. Shipped it in. May 1st. <laughs> we had to get all our food to Yellowknife, so we did a lot of pre-packing and pre-sending. And I packed this and sent it to Kyle in Yellowknife a month ago. So I'm glad we're eating it now because the cheese is already starting to sweat. The cheese already went on a canoe trip before this canoe trip. So far this has been an excellent portage. Perfect weather, open country. I thought I was going on vacation, but instead now I'm carrying heavy canoe for these two men. It's been a long day. We got up early and uh, portaged up this mountain. It's pretty crazy. Day one, when we're the absolute heaviest, we are carrying three times on these portages. I think we've gone up about 800 feet. So, it's a bit of a slog. Over 20 kilometers of walking, more than half of which, we have like 80 pounds over our head. 
We're feeling good. Spirits are high. It's a bad, it's a bad, bad life. It's actually not a bad way to get yourself into a big canoe trip like this. Good first day. We'll be working our way into the Barrens. We've officially made it to a part of the portage. We are now calling Bug Alley. Thick with bugs as soon as we entered. It's getting a little mucky to walk through. I don't think I'm gonna make it much further without a bug jacket. I thought we were done climbing. It just keeps going up. You're not even supposed to go swimming 30 minutes after eating, let alone hiking up straight up a mountain. Do you guys feel like the oxygen is thinning? <laughs> 1.6k. Uh. We're getting so close to the end. We're pretty sure this one last hill behind us, we just have to get over that and we'll be able to get eyes on Henry Lake. We have about 800 meters left. We're all starting to feel a little sore, so we're about ready to get this done. <laughs> I'm looking up ahead of me, you can't see it. But ahead of me is, the, I think, the, the summit. And it's a big ridge, a couple hundred feet. We gotta get up. See that? That's the lake. Oh yeah. Oh baby. Oh. Good job, oh, dude. Man. It's <sighs> a huge milestone. Huge milestone. Oh yeah. Central Beach? Oh wow. Yeah. Big day. Really big day. I had a low about 30 minutes ago. Looking up the final hill to get here, but. How many pounds of gear are we? 600 and 670 pounds of gear. Not, not including canoes. Yeah, two canoes. Yeah, epic day. This is a crux right off the bat. We usually don't start a trip with such a, uh, a large portage. We've never done this before. The last few days have been a whirlwind organizing gear and we haven't gotten much sleep. Last couple nights we probably all got anywhere from two to four hours of sleep. Best case scenario, we thought we could get over. So we are in a great situation to start off this trip. Windsor's no, Canadian. I know we don't have any, any uh... in Calgary, Canada. <laughs> How much do you want? Like that. Yeah, start there. Brother. Thank you. Brother number yeah. two. Blood, <laughs> blood brothers. We should just be called brother. <laughs> Cheers. Yo, boys, that was a amazing first day. Great being in the bush with you. Oh, yes. Great. Great. Cheers. Cheers, boys. Cheers. Yeah. Tabasco sauce and crispy fried onions on top. Woo! <laughs> it's all still sinking in that we're out here, and we have a month ahead of us. I'm just so grateful to be out here, back on the land. I just hiked up one of the hills here just to get an eye on the surrounding landscape. And it is wild. It is very different than anywhere I've been before. This burn really makes it look like a desolate landscape, but that's not true. These burn sites are rich in biodiversity and the most prevalent species is the mosquito. And I'm learning that this morning.
We're sitting there, sipping on our coffees. Kyle's telling us how he's just gonna go get changed into his clothes for the day, and in mid-sentence, switches to say, and that's a muskox. And there's a muskox just cruising over the hills. He looks stoic up on the, on the rocks. They're very prehistoric looking. Is that your first time seeing one? First muskox. And on day two, so early in the trip. I liked how you could hear the, on the Flip. rocks, you could hear the clanging of his hooves on the, yeah. on the granite. Yeah. So cool. Today we are continuing on with Pike's Portage. Yesterday we had an absolute grind. Today we continue on that grind. We have at least three portages over a kilometer long before we reach Artillery Lake and a couple smaller ones in between. But the good news is that we actually have some lake paddling to break that up today, which will be a real nice treat versus yesterday where it was just straight. It was a march, yesterday was a march. So I'm just getting my life jacket all geared up here to start our day. First time paddling on this trip. We've got a nice big pocket at the front and I'm gonna utilize it with the three most important things that I need for today. Snacks, bug spray, and finally, some bear bangers, just in case we take some heat. First fish of the trip. What's it gonna be? Looks trout-esque. A little laker. Still kicking. First fish. Nice laker. See you, brother. Good job, buddy. Nice. Pike's Portage is the route from Great Slave Lake up to the Barren Lands. They've been used for thousands of years. The start of it is the 4.6 kilometer portage that we did yesterday, but it is a string of lakes and portages that's about 40 kilometers long. That'll get us up to Artillery Lake, which is the next big lake on our trip. Today, we're gonna have a bunch of lakes and smaller portages, but it's all considered Pike's Portage, this entire route. We're paddling into the afternoon. We've done a few small portages this morning, stopped for a bite to eat, but now it is getting pretty hot. But the scenery is beautiful. We've been seeing more barren land and a lot more exposed bedrock. It is smoking hot out here today. The sun is blazing down. I feel like in my preparation for this trip, I definitely planned more for being cold than warm, and the, the sun is is beating down on us today. I feel like I have borderline heat stroke. We're coming up to our first big portage of the day. I don't think anyone's really in the mindset right now to actually start undertaking another big portage after the, the day we had yesterday, but we're gonna have to get our minds straight and get ready to trek on with what could be a very difficult portage. I see something to the right here. Yeah, we got the trail here. Oh yeah, right there. One, two, three. Whoa, <laughs> shit. <laughs> you gotta tighten up your uh, drag. Peel in line. You, you love how bike fight until they get up to the boat. It's a good sized pike. That's a real nice fish, mate. <laughs> Look at the size of that beauty. Woo! Yo, he's coming to chill in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> Big portage of the day. Here we go. 1600. Coming at you. How far up will we climb on this portage? We're gonna find out. We're gonna find out.
Yo, it's just me, G Rizza, and my big brother. We hear them boys coming over the hill. Yeah, yo, yo, here we go now. Yeah. Yo, blah, 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 broke the law, and blah, 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 lobster, lobster in the lobby. Yo, whoa, whoa. Yep, yep. So we came across a, a trap. Some of these portages that we're on are, I guess they're trap lines as well. So there'd be some sort of food in there and something like a marten or a mink or a weasel would go in there to eat it and uh, it would lock down on them. We're just finishing up this portage. It's probably a little past six o'clock, dinner time. And I think there's a good wind here. It's open country, there's some firewood. I think this is gonna be our spot. It's a long day and we're still sort of recovering from the lack of sleep that we started off with. So this might be it. As we've been moving through these portages, we have been seeing signs of human activity. And it is really cool to see because this is a very historic route. Some of these fire pits can be hundreds of years old. Typically people are gonna stop and camp at similar spots after long portages, sandy beaches, windy points. It's interesting, and then you go to a spot and you're like, oh, that's a cool campsite. And then you see old signs of other people camping. We all think very similar. Warburton Pike. He's the pike that Pike's Portage is named after. The first Western recreational paddler up here. And he assembled a kind of a crew and they, I think they came up for at least one whole season, maybe two. And he was kind of ahead of his time. He held the Dene in high regard and adopted a lot of their practices, which can't be said for a lot of his contemporaries who, uh, you know, didn't respect Dene way of life and thought, you know, the British way was the only way. Yeah, he was just like a rich guy who wanted to check this part of the world out, so he, he came up here, and that's why, yeah, Warburton Pike. Pike's Portage is named after him. We did about 23 kilometers, which is pretty good, considering how many portages we did and how hot it was. Throughout this trip, we're gonna be traveling through two eco zones. The first is the Tega Shield, which is what we're seeing and what we've been traveling through, which is a lot of exposed Precambrian rock with intermittent sparse jack pines, black spruce, tamaracks, and birch trees. And then above the tree line is the Southern Arctic. And you can already tell on the hills here that it's starting to get barren, so we're getting close. If all goes well, we'll reach Artillery Lake tomorrow, and that is a monster lake that is about 50 kilometers long. Rumor has it, on the northern tip is where the tree line is. because they were fine until they got wet, like halfway up the first day of pikes, and then they, they just, as soon as they got wet, it, you could tell they started blistering fast. Morning, sir. Morning. Mosquitoes are out in full force this morning. Yesterday was smoking hot. I went to bed in essentially just a light shirt and shorts, and then woke up in the middle of the night, freezing cold. The temperature had dropped a ton. I had my woolies nearby, so I was able to jump into those, heat myself up, and get comfortable. But it's all about temperature regulation out here, and you need to make sure you've got those things close by. 
But today it does look like it's gonna get hot again. There's no wind and it's, you just feel it. You can feel it in the air. It's gonna be hot. Today the mission is to get to Artillery Lake and finish Pike's Portage. We have three significant portages to get there. We've started a little earlier today and hopefully we can beat that, that mid-afternoon sun that was scorching us yesterday. So we're going to be starting a, uh, about a 1.2 kilometer portage for breakfast here. My nipples have been chafing on portages. I don't know if it's a life jacket or what's going on, but something's pressing up against. And it's mainly when I've got my life jacket on with the canoe, constantly just rubbing up against them. They're pretty sensitive today. We didn't take a map on our first go, so we just were following the path. And then it got really rocky, and then we started seeing cairns everywhere. So we followed them to what looks to be a pond. Yo, is that just a pond? But you don't know if it goes anywhere. The cairns seem to take us to a pond over there. Yeah. That looks very much just like a pond. There's another body of water over there that looks like it might be bigger and maybe the right way to go. Yeah. But the cairns all lead to the pond. Yeah, yeah. We. You probably drop right by that pond there. Yeah. And we just need to go a bit further. Okay. Shit. We were close. We're close. Well, maybe we'll... Maybe just drop by the canoes then and then... Or we'll... we can just even blast it. I'm fine. You, if you're yeah, good, just you blast guys. it. Yeah, we'll just go all the way. Okay. All right. Okay. This is my favorite portage yet. Me too. <laughs> Where you can tell we're getting into barren land now. Yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful out here. Yeah, look at it. Look at the vistas. I know. This is by far my favorite portage yet. This is the first portage where it feels like we're portaging into the barren lands. The southern boundary of the barren lands is considered where the tree line is. And there's five main factors what stop tree growth. And that happens both longitudinally to the north and increase in altitude on mountains. Five things. First thing, permafrost. More permafrost, less possibility for roots to grow into the ground. Second, the amount of organic matter in the soil. The third is wind. It gets really windy out here and any small plants that grow with a very shallow root system will just get blown over. Fourth is the amount of precipitation. The Arctic is considered a cold version of a desert. In Canada, the prevailing winds come from the west off the Pacific Ocean and all this evaporation creates clouds full of moisture on the Pacific and they come across and hit the Rocky Mountains and it causes them to rise. And as they rise, they hit the dew point where the moisture then starts to precipitate out. And then over the mountains is the dry air that then sweeps the tundra. So there's not a lot of rain here. There's actually five times less annual precipitation here compared to out east. And the fifth thing is it is super cold here. There's only about a two month growing season. And in the winters, it can actually get so cold that it freezes the inner sap of trees and that would kill them. So those are the five main reasons there's no trees in the Arctic. We've just completed the third last portage to Artillery Lake. When I'm on a portage, I really start to appreciate the walk back where you're not carrying gear and it's a nice hike where you get to actually take in all the landscape around you. And today has definitely been a day that I've been finding myself getting lost in the landscape out here because it's just absolutely stunning. We're definitely entering the barren lands now and uh, we're gonna be saying goodbye to the tree line pretty soon. Just on. Uh... One of the, the last portages here, Pike's Portage. It's actually quite a nice one. It's pretty straightforward. We can see the trail pretty well and we're so far away from other folks, but somehow way out here, there's 
this uh, real nice trail. I think it's a reminder that while this portage might not get a lot of folks annually, it's been here for a really long time. We have made it to the final portage going into Artillery Lake. A moment we've been working towards for the last two and a half days. It's been a complete grind so far. This portage is around 1,200 meters and a big milestone for us getting past Pike's portage. so good. We made it to our artillery, finally. Oh my God. The team has officially made it to Artillery Lake, something we've been working on for the last three days with heavy packs and a ton of gear. And we finally made it. Time to have some lunch and just soak in the views. There was once water and then you go on a massive portage and then you realize that all water should have electrolytes. The biggest portage I've ever done. I don't know if I'll ever do bigger. We are getting to Artillery Lake and rumor has it there's gonna be some Lunker Lake trout in there. So I just rigged up a setup for trolling off the back of the boat. We are gonna be trolling at a decent clip, so it's gonna be hard to keep our spoons at depth. Lake trout likes to stay deep, so you wanna get your spoon or your lure down to them. You don't want them to come up because they're not gonna go for your, for your lure that's skipping along the surface. So, what I did is I set up a three-way snap swivel with a one ounce weight with about two and a half feet of line to a Williams wobbler on a snap swivel. This is gonna wobble through the water at depth, hopefully, and hopefully get a lake trout. We also have a competition going between the guys. Biggest fish of the trip. And on these big lakes, these are the best opportunities to get those big lake trout. So I'm gonna start with one ounce weight. If I can't get it down deep enough, I might increase it to two or three. went straight down. Oh my god. <laughs> Unless it's like a stick. It's not a stick, man. You have an enormous lake trout on there. And it hasn't even seen the boat yet. Yeah. Like that's just pure weight. Oh my god. <laughs> just tire him out. Just tire him out. You have time is on your side here, Graham. Let's give him a little space here. You might want to go to the beach, to be honest. It might not be a bad idea. I think idea. he's maybe seeing you too, eh? Yeah. No. He doesn't want to come. <laughs> He'll tire him out. He'll come. You got time. 
it will take you right into the cobblestone beast here. And then we can both get out and we can get them in the net. It's a nice one. Good fish, G. Now we just gotta land them. Yeah! Oh, oh buddy! Oh my god, that thing's a tank! I think the first one was about the same size. But it just wasn't fighting nearly as hard as this guy. We weren't on the lake for more than 15 minutes and Graham hooked into dinner. Big ol' lake trout. That's so beautiful. I really just caught this thing. He's not small. <laughs> Go pull start recording. You got a good bend there going on, Noah. I do. He just moved, like, he has a lot of weight to him, I think. We're paddling and all of a sudden, like a shoal came up. It dropped off and he was right there. Oh my god! Oh! Holy shit, this is a big ass. <laughs> oh my god. Yo, I'm gonna take you to shore. <laughs> One's in the middle there, eh? You don't want the net? Uh, I don't know if you're gonna fit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. You're huge. Testing on there. 20. Nice. I don't think it'll break. I, I think it, it's, it'll be the hook that comes out. Whoa. Thunder. When you get ready. Um, I, I think I get him. He's getting tired now. Well, that's a good sign. Let me know. Here, just film. Noah. Well done, buddy. Oh my god, dude. Oh, smokes. <laughs> oh my god, dude. That's that a tank.
We just got a glimpse of Artillery Lake proper. The first few kilometers was in a narrow section and it slowly opens up. And you can see in the far distance over there, it looks like a break wall, but that's, that's true Artillery Lake. We're not gonna get there today. We're looking for a camp right now, but tomorrow it's gonna feel like we're paddling on the ocean. This is a big lake. I've noticed the temperature is actually feeling colder with the breeze coming in. I think we're definitely coming up to a very big body of water that potentially might still have ice on it. We heard from some pilots. <laughs> we heard from some pilots a few days ago that there was still ice on this lake, probably about five days ago. So curious to see what we have up ahead. For this trip, I was recommended to get a four season tent, specifically for the high winds that could happen through here. So I did a lot of research and I came up with the Marmot three person Thor for two people on this trip. It's about 11 pounds and so far it's been awesome. It doesn't take up that much space in the dry bag, about 20 liters worth of space. So far it's pretty comfortable in there for two people. You might even be able to comfortably fit a third if need be. That was a crazy yeah. first three days to the start of that yeah. trip. <laughs> yeah, goodness. Oh, okay, well then it's good. Oh. A little thunder in the background. Oh. Fresh caught lake trip. Oh yeah. A little bit of uh, fish crisp on there. So good. That was caught about two hours ago. Just got a text on the inReach from uh, my dad, who's like following along. And 96 years ago today, John, is it John Hornby? He said Jack Hornby, I thought it was John Hornby. Uh, camped on the south end of artillery, um, yeah, 96 years ago today. Which would have been the trip, his fateful trip up to the Thelon, where he then died, I guess, that following winter. So, pretty cool. Maybe he was here, who knows. Okay, whiskey roulette. Anybody? Yes. Please. Yes, a sort of whiskey, please. Woke up to some eerie conditions on Artillery Lake. We got some rain on the horizon that we can see coming down the lake. It goes from calm to gusty, so we might get wet today. Might cool off a little bit. What a beautiful world. Oh, yeah, It's pretty crazy what the weather has been doing. You can see these pockets of rain coming down and we're about to paddle through one coming up very shortly here, but then there's blue sky in another direction. We're getting to the main section of the lake and we all around the same time started feeling how chilly the wind was getting. And on the horizon there, you can actually still see ice on the lake. Like the temperature must have dropped instantly five, 10 degrees. That's crazy, it's still thick. In the horizon we could see some seagulls sitting on the water. It looked like maybe a sandbar or something that we were coming up to. And then when we got closer we realized it was actually ice. There's still ice on this lake and we just paddled through our first little patch of it. I think there's going to be a lot more where that came from. 
definitely explains the drop in the, the temperature and also the water here is absolutely freezing and I, and I have a feeling that that's only going to get colder the further that we get out as well. Big old bear dumps. Is that what those are? Yeah. Hello, bear! I can't imagine how big the ice chunks must be pushing up against that. Well, if, in the winter it would be at least 10 feet thick. Man, we are in the barrens. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I trying to shake it. Oh, you have him snagged on the side. No, do I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's a beauty one too. That's awesome. Really nice, really nice the pattern on. It is. He's freezing cold. It's a cold fish. That makes me feel good. He wasn't bleeding or anything. So the rock that we're going to be traveling through throughout this entire trip is known as the Slave Craton, and that's a Precambrian metamorphosized volcanic rock that's dated to be around 2.5 billion years old. But there's one outcrop that scientists found about 300 kilometers north of Yellowknife that is over 4 billion years old. And that's the oldest rock in the world. Literally, the oldest rock in the world. But what makes this slave craton so interesting is it's one of the only places in the world where you can find diamonds near the Earth's surface. And that's because of the geological structure of the craton, as well as the chemical composition of the mantle below it. Even in terms of crustal standards, the slave craton is about 300 kilometers thick. And that puts a lot of pressure on the mantle below it. So much so that it pressurizes that mantle to crystallize into diamonds. And that's because the magma down there has a lot of carbon in it. And that's what you need for diamonds. But the thing is, these diamonds are still 300 kilometers below the Earth's surface. So it's not feasible to mine. But because of all that pressure, there can be minor eruptions. And this magma actually comes up cracks and fractures through the crust to the surface up these geological structures known as kimberlite pipes. And that's what geologists and prospectors look for when they're looking for mines in this area are these kimberlite pipes. And this is one of the only places in the earth where you can find these diamonds in the kimberlite pipes near the earth's surface. We're starting to see even more ice along the route that we're traveling right now and it's forcing us in towards the shore. We don't want to go on the outside of this ice, forcing us into the middle of the lake because who knows what could happen out there. We could get trapped and then we're at the, the mercy of the weather. So we're going to stick as close to the shoreline as we can and hope that there's a clear path the whole way just along the shoreline. The ice has boxed us in. We're not able to get by in this particular spot. 
We're actually gonna go climb a hill nearby to see if we can scope out the rest of the lake because if we can, if we continue on down this path and it just continues to, to choke up like this with ice, this might be the, the wrong side of the lake to take or we might need to come up with like a different strategy. As far as the eye can see, we're iced out. So we're hoping we can follow the shoreline all the way down, but we don't know. Yeah, there's definitely quite a long stretch there where there's no open water. Just even while we're scouting here, you can see the wind pushing the ice, which we also need to factor into our decision about which way we take. It looks like the ice could continue to pinch us this way, but it also, the winds could shift and all of a sudden pinch us the other way. Maybe we give her and just see what happens. Yeah. Like that might stop ice from flowing in. They might like clog it up a bit. Here, if we can get up to the islands, there's like a 30 kilometer channel between the islands and the, and the shore. There's open water here. We just need to get in here and then we have all, all of this will be open. We can get up to here and then we'll probably hit a wall. The biggest part of the lake, we'll probably hit a wall of ice again. And the wind is supposed to go, the wind has been blowing west, which is why, why we have ice here. But tomorrow the wind is supposed to go south, which will blow it all to the other side of the lake. We might have a window. So we'll have a window. Tomorrow is Thursday. We'll have a good window to blast it because the, the wind has been blowing to this side of the lake. Yeah. We got to a point where the ice is right up against shore and we are iced out. So we're gonna dress into our dry pants and uh, try to walk our boats through this, these little chunks of ice. What we have on our side is it's not just one big flat piece of ice, it's, it's chunks. So we might be able to move some around it to uh, find a path, but we wanna to get to that island far, far in the distance there. That's sort of the goal, because we know behind that island, there's a decent amount of open water to paddle when we scoped it with the uh, binoculars a little farther back. And just getting to that point, that's gonna be the, the slog. We've been absolutely grinding all afternoon, trying to push through as far as we can with the ice and just make as much distance as we can. We think this ice is gonna be breaking up pretty soon, but we don't really have the luxury to just wait for that to happen. So we need to continue to push and we're, we're going a little bit slower than a walking pace right now, but we don't have to carry weight on our shoulders where we are making headway with relatively minimal effort. We're just taking turns swapping people in and out of the boats, trying to give a few people a break and then a few people on. We're just going to keep doing what we can. We've been going it for about three hours and we're halfway to the point where we think we'll be ice free. We're pretty much going a kilometer an hour here so we're hoping we'll be there for dinner. Yeah, brother. Took a little bit longer than we thought, but we made it. We made it to the beach. There's this big mountain that's almost like a peninsula. And when we scouted it, 
way back about 10 kilometers that looked to be open water on the other side. We're gonna cross our fingers because this might make or break the trip if it's all frozen in. Dude, that's looking pretty good. No way. Oh. That is some good news. That is some good news. So we climbed a hill next to camp to get a better vantage, to get an idea of what we're dealing with tomorrow. Taking a look at from here, the good news is we see a lot of open water. We get to start our day with a little bit of a paddle tomorrow, but we'll have to see what uh, what we end up running into a little bit further down the lake. What do you see in the binocs? In the far, far distance, we see what looks to be a big sheet of thick ice. Very, very white, not like this broken up stuff here. Again, we're very far away, so maybe it's an illusion. We hope it's an illusion. <laughs> May maybe. If it is a big sheet of ice, maybe we'll be able to paddle the shorelines because typically those melt first. All of these things we're not going to be able to, to answer until we're up there and we'll just have to kind of see what we end up, uh, the cards we end up getting dealt on that one. Um, it's open for the next little while, but there's still a question mark in the distance. Okay. Which is like, we can show you on the camera. We have a little bit of a patch over there, nothing compared to like what we did today. Okay. But then once we're through that, we've got like a nice stretch of paddling and then far, far, far distance, like binocular distance, yeah. it question mark. Like it, we just see white and it looks like it could just be like literally a solid block of ice. <laughs> Yeah, where the lake opens up. So maybe that's still like the the thick ice of the winter, but... I just need the wind to go offshore there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, yeah. Fingers crossed. But at least we get to have our breakfast tomorrow morning and start with a, a paddle. <laughs> oh. You want the white sauce? Yeah. Garlic. Like rose or garlic alfredo. We had dinner, we did our chores, we all jumped in the water, and we heard a crack of thunder. And now the wind picked up, and it looks like we're gonna get hit with some serious rain. So we battened down the hatch, and we're gonna put her to bed. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Let's all hope for clear passage. It's gonna be another hot one today. When we woke up, we already started to notice that the ice is starting to melt, which is a great sign. How much change to the ice just over 12 hours gives us a lot of hope. And with how hot it is, I don't know how there can still be ice here, but there's sections where it's still like six inches thick. This morning we're gonna portage over the spit to the open side of the lake there, and then try to sneak around the back. Last night we scouted this area and there was ice. There's no ice now, so we're optimistic. Come on, buddy. <laughs> it's my fish. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fish. Nice, that's a fatty. That's dinner? That's dinner, yeah. He might have got closed out again with the ice. We had a pretty good morning of paddling too.
The ice has completely blocked us in once again. We're talking it over as a team. Yesterday we made it about five kilometers in six hours of really hard work, breaking through the ice and pushing our way through. We're gonna scout the far point to see if we can see how far this ice goes. There's a lot of ice out there. Way more than I would have guessed. You know, Great Slave, which is only 40 kilometers from here and bigger, is all open. And then you look and it's, it's like white ice you can walk on. I don't know. I think we need to do some scheming on what the plan is. What's plan B, Noah? I actually can't believe how much white we're seeing. Yeah, it's not even like patchy or anything. There's a little bit of unknowns or variables with how this plays out and how much of an impact this has on our overall trip. Every day that we need to wait for the ice to melt is setting us behind schedule. We need to be hitting about 33 kilometers a day on average to uh, make the trip happen in the time that we have for it and you know every day that we miss on that is basically just adding more distance to each of those days it's gonna be interesting it's a bit of a confusing time right now we're gonna go back to camp and just kind of regroup and try to figure out a strategy and come up with some kind of plan B's just in the event that this ice is out here longer than we think. It's looking pretty thick, pretty far out there. We're not even in the biggest part of Artillery Lake yet. So it's gonna be interesting to see how this all plays out. You can still see how thick it is here. Yeah. There's a lot of holes, but it's at least four or five inches. So it's now an official rest day for us. And unlike most rest days, when there's a heavy wind or strong rain, it's a pretty beautiful day. So we're gonna make the best use of the day and do a little fishing. The wind shifting directions. We've got a really hot day today, so hopefully another great day of melt that it'll be more beneficial for our time to be spent relaxing here, taking, taking it easy, than getting another five to 10 kilometers, which it, once this melts, we'll be able to do in two hours. Alex, you could probably transfer to this one. <laughs> it's like a red carpet into shore. <laughs> I don't know that it is. So the one benefit to having a lake filled with ice is that we could keep our fish fresh by putting it on ice. They're so red. Yeah, it's like salmon, man. Cutting up some lake trout. It's so pink, you'd think it was salmon. We caught this one this morning and we were like, holy shit, that's pink. And now the second one is even pinker. It's unbelievable. First of all, this is a cool piece of ice because it's showing how it has been thawing on the lake. We are gonna take advantage of this ice once again since it is kind of keeping us trapped right now. We're gonna also use this ice in our whiskey tonight 
and have a, a toast to the lake gods and the, the weather gods who are all going to be on our side thawing this bad boy up. A bartender here. <laughs> Cheers to the wind. Cheers, Cheers to the self yeah. <laughs> The weather gods being on our side. And the trout. And the trout. And the fishermen that caught it. Cheers, boys. Just, I think you just need to wear the glove and you need to actually yeah. man the pan. You want it to be hot, hot, hot? Well, I don't need to add more flame, but I just want to well, it. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. Look at that. Oh. Deep fryer. Man, look at that. Yeah, it smells fantastic. You can basically probably start eating, and these ones can just cook while we're eating. Get a big one here. Something growing. Yeah. Tartar will stay, so I was thinking we could split it between two or three fish dinners, just so everybody knows. Oh, man. Oh, my God. It's like. More like salmon than it is trout. It's like, look at the color on there. This awesome, this awesome might be the best camp meal ever had. Yeah. Dude, amazing job on it. No worries. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We got a quick weather update here. The ice situation has changed drastically in the last 15 minutes. We had a light breeze just gust in offshore and the ice just extended out. I don't know how pretty. How far is that? Like 50 yards, yeah. with just a little gust. So this is pretty good to see. We just need wind. This is the only time we're praying for wind on a big lake, but we need the wind to break up the ice, or at least push it. It is the morning of day six and we are hoping to actually be able to paddle this morning. As you can see with a mix of favorable wind conditions and the beating hot sun yesterday, there is no longer ice in our immediate bay here and pretty much as far as we can see at this point. The goal today is going to be to paddle as far as the ice will possibly allow us. We know that there is some thick ice up ahead and we're hoping that there might be a channel along the shoreline that we're able to paddle, but essentially we are just going to continue pushing as far as we possibly can and, and hopefully make up some distance today. All right, Artillery Lake, what do you got for us today? I don't know what's around this corner. There might be ice, there might be open water. Last night I went to take a pee at around two o'clock in the morning and there's a strong offshore wind. So hopefully that was enough to open up the, the ice gateway for us. This bay that we're paddling right now is the iced over section that we scouted yesterday. We're gonna keep going. Every point where we're just crossing our fingers, we go around the corner and there's a, a nice little pathway for us. So far, so good. Let's keep it going. Take me back out. <laughs> 
waters there. We've had a very productive morning so far today. We've managed to crush about 15 kilometers of distance in just a couple hours. It's only 10.30. There's still quite a bit of ice on this lake and we're lucky because the wind has pushed it out far enough that we've been able to find a channel along shore. We're not out of the clear just yet and every corner that we come up to is going to be a guessing game in terms of whether we'll be able to get through or not. We parked on this beach and you can tell it's sort of terraced and that's because of the ice pushing up against the beach. And it's really obvious here how thick the ice was based on this ridge here. There's a clear edge with a nice slope here to flat land. The ice pushed it up, taking this little terrace. He's about to go under the beach. Don't point that at anyone. Was that the bear banger? That was the bear banger. Bear bangers do the trick there. I wonder, it might be sick or something. Seems pretty sketchy. I wondered that. Like, is there something wrong with them? I didn't think he'd come at us like that. No, and he's like spinning and shit as he was coming at us. Yeah, that's not normal. That was the wildest wolf experience I ever had. We saw a wolf in the distance and we thought it was really cool to see a wolf as it is. It started coming closer and closer to us to a point where we went from it was exciting to see a wolf to we were a little nervous for our own safety. I don't know how, how close it got, but it got really close to us. Do you have any words to say about that experience? <laughs> yeah. I mean, same as Noah. I had a wolf experience a couple of years ago on a beach, kind of similar to this, where the wolf was like walking along the beach and we were swimming. Um, but as soon as it went into like uh, hunter mode, the, the wolf in that experience like changed the way it was acting and kind of started crouching. And this wolf didn't do that, like the whole kind of way. It just kind of looked like it was confused and out of it and just started coming right towards us and a bit startling. <laughs> I'm glad we had the bear banger and the gun. It all happens so quick too. That's the other thing which is I think is a good reminder. You know it's like wildlife experiences are are really great at a distance but it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long and like before like a wolf that's 400 meters down the beach to like running at you. Man that's sweaty sweaty palms. Yeah. Um, heart was definitely beaten. Close call. See the way down there now. Yeah. We were yelling at it and it was almost like we were calling its name. Yeah. <laughs> 
He's like, yo, what's here, boy. up? Here, boy. Yeah. Oh, you guys want to chill? <laughs> And then like literally is just running up again. <laughs> we went back on shore and the wolf came right back for us. So we're sort of stuck between the ice edge and a mangy wolf. So we're doing the best we can. We are going to uh, slowly work our way through the ice flow to try to get around this point where we hope there's open water while staying far and clear from this wolf. Oh my god! Don't let him under the ice! Is it huge? It's huge! <laughs> so, can you back it up? Yeah. yeah. When he set the hook, he didn't even move. He was like, what, the, what was that? Go sit down. <laughs> it's a tank. Be good. Be good. Oh, oh my god. Holy smokes. He's gonna. Oh, oh man. <laughs> that is massive. Getting him back. off. <laughs> that was wild. There's so many things going on there. <laughs> <laughs> to play him in the ice like that. <laughs> he kept wanting to dive under, take off. We had to work this small little pool here to like keep him away from the ice. And why are we this far away from shore? <sighs> because we're currently being chased by a mangy wolf. <laughs> So, might not have been the best time to throw a line in the water, but this thing was friggin' massive. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Alright, as we were, boys. So, we have a bit of a decision to make right now. The ice is really close to shore. And we're having difficulty knowing how far, how much farther we can go. And there's this wolf here. This would be a good, this would be a great camping spot. But there's this wolf here that's extremely curious. We don't know what its deal is. If it has mange, or it's never seen a human before. But it, but it was acting strange. So we've been humming and hawing with our what our best option is. If we go back a few kilometers and camp there, or camp on an island that's just around this corner. If you go back, we're still technically in the, the wolf's territory. If you go on the island, we're good. But it does take a bit of a guess to see if we can get to the island based on the ice condition. And once we go, we're sort of committed to that option. Thought about this for a little bit, and I think we're gonna go for that island. We're gonna have two guys moving the canoes through the water, pushing through the ice, and the two guys on shore on lookout just in case this wolf gets curious again.
And then it looks like it actually there is a strip of water that could get us out to that point, which is this, maybe get us as far as this point. We get there and then if there's a clear shot over back to the beach on the far side, we'll go for it. Yeah. I like that plan. Oh, now we just hit bottom. We managed to push on a few extra kilometers beyond where we had the problem with the wolf earlier, but once again, we ended up getting iced out. The good news is the winds have really picked up since we've landed here at camp for the night. The forecast is that the wind is supposed to be picking up to 35 kilometers an hour tomorrow from the south southeast, which is exactly what we want. Already, since the wind has picked up, we're already seeing ice push out of this bay away from the shore. Our hope is that tomorrow morning we'll have more of a clear pathway to hopefully be able to get ourselves to the end of the lake. For now, we're kind of at the mercy of the weather and we're gonna hunker down for the night. The other nice thing about this wind is that there's no bugs right now, which is a huge reprieve. And just cross our fingers that that wind is gonna be favorable and push that ice out for us. moment of truth is there still ice I can still see it a decent wall of it we'll see what happens when I get around this point though before all this ice was stuck to shore but now you see the horizon line which is still ice that might connect to that far point but this entire bay is open, which is great news because we are at a pinch point on the lake, an area that narrows, and that's what we got stuck on yesterday. So if we can get around this corner, we might have clear sailing. Today we have a forecasted um, like a southeast wind and a pretty strong one. And there's been wind forecasts the last few days that have been similar, but there hasn't. They've been light, and we haven't really got any wind. But today it's forecast to be pretty strong, and it's. 6.30 in the morning and it's already blowing so I think it is going to be going to fill in and um, that's good because it'll ideally push all this ice from this side of the lake to the other side of the lake and allow us a channel up the uh, east side of the lake to the Lockhart River which is it's not far it's like 30 kilometers away give this wind a couple hours uh, give us a route. <laughs> picking up so we're throwing on the spray decks. Artillery Lake is one of the largest lakes on our trip and the big thing is the other shoreline there is about 15 kilometers away. In windy conditions we want to stick to the shore because a gust of wind could come through or a weather system can come through and push us out into there which we do not want. You have to take big legs very seriously especially when they're this cold and the ice is literally still on the lake. A little bit of a tailwind now. Be a tailwind like all the way to the That'd be all right. Yeah. We did it. Oh, we did it. Two days becomes five, but <laughs> right there is the river right mouth. There it is. We have just got to the mouth of the Lockhart River which means we've officially finished Artillery Lake. Done with the ice, hopefully. Though I shouldn't say that. But this is a big milestone for us. Beautiful lake, 
glad we had the time to spend on it, but also very happy to be off of it. We have a lot more land to see. The Lockhart's holding some trout at the bottom. So we just got to the lock trout, couple casts. The lock trout? <laughs> just got to the Lockhart, couple casts. This one's gonna be dinner. Kyle's also hooked up. Can't beat it. <laughs> Double header! Double header! Man, every lake trout is a beautiful big ass lake trout. I know. We came around the corner on the Lockhart River. There looks to be a homestead of sorts. There's like four or five buildings. Yeah, I've got a little homestead up in Northwest Territories on the Lockhart River. Got an electric fence. Must be for bear. Crazy. Must be uh, an old hunt camp. Yeah. Wildlife galore, six grizzlies, six white wolves, one wolverine, one moose, one muskox. Lakers up the wazoo. Fallon man, nice pull with bow, 51 yards, one shot. It's kind of sad to see it like just abandoned like this. All this stuff just kind of left here. Animals have gotten into it clearly. It's kind of sad. I get, I, I get it's obviously expensive to pull this stuff out, but... We made it to camp. It's a long day. I think we might have hit 40k today. We'll have to double check, but we really needed that after all those slow days on Artillery Lake and Pike's Portage. Put in a full day's work, and now we have a beautiful campsite right near these rapids, so it's going to be a nice evening. One, two, three. 16.5, 12.4, and 11.1, so 40. Good job. 40k. There we go. We hit 40? Yeah. Good day, boys. That was a really good day. Yeah. That was awesome. So I think I romanticized the idea of sleeping beside the rapids a little too much earlier. We're kind of on a boggy mound here in Mosquito Haven. I would say the buggiest site yet, but we did get close to the rapids anyways. You can see them over there, pretty close. And we hit 40 kilometers today, and that was by far our biggest day. And we sort of needed that because of the, all this time we spent in artillery. I don't know if it's the highlight of the trip, but it was like the, definitely the highlight of the day and the most emotion I had on the trip is <laughs> Graham and I were like just coming into a rapid and we had like a bunch of firewood on top of our bags and then a pelican case holding camera gear on top of that. So like the, just all our gear wasn't like stable and my fishing rod was just sitting on the deck. And as, we, and as the boat bow caught the rapid, like the pelican case kind of slid off the firewood and knocked the fishing rod into the river and it was like just vanished and then like we had, had to do a big loop and come kind of come back over that part right at the eddy line and I could like then see it and it was like 10 12 maybe 15 feet down in water that is freezing cold in an eddy of a rapid and I was like man this rod is gone you know like I was like I'm not gonna be able to fish for the next three weeks and then Graham and I like started like he put all the weights on the line and we started casting for it and we actually reeled it up. I couldn't believe it. I was like hooting and hollering and like had the biggest high of the whole trip because we saved this rod. I never thought we would actually get it that way, but we got it that way. I, I like was resigned to the fact that I'd have to dive in and like try to get it myself. But as Graham said, you can only try that like two or three times before you get hypothermic and then you just got to give up and move on. So anyway, highlight of my day. So 
So I'm gonna do a quick demonstration of the type of fishing up here. I have a one ounce white jig with a white Mr. Twister tail at the bottom of these rapids. I'm gonna do my first cast. See what we can catch. This place is teeming with lake trout. And that's actually kind of a small one, to be honest. The fishing doesn't get better than this, I'm telling you. So now that we know there's a lot of fish here, I'm gonna try the ultimate challenge. And that's see if a lake trout wants to eat a little mouse on the fly rod. I'm gonna wait out a bit, because I feel like if the mouse went down the rapids, it would get stuck in the eddy and make its way back there. So I'm gonna be the mouse and uh, see if we can get a lake trout to rise. Yo, Noah, you gotta make that mouse dance, brother. What do you got, Kyle? The grayling. Oh my god, first grayling of the trip. No. Oh. Holy smokes. It's a big. I never caught a grayling this big before. Okay. Oh my god. Pass me the flyers there. Eh? Oh, I got them. I got them. Oh my god, dude. <laughs> Yo, you gotta hold up the fin. Isn't that like tradition? Yeah, yeah. I just don't want to lose them. Wow. Dude, that's awesome, man. Yeah, that's a good size. Holy I've never smokes. caught a grayling. You got the first grayling, yeah, brother. first grayling. It is five minutes to six o'clock. Coffee is ready, the bugs are out, and it's time to get the boys up. Oh boys, breakfast is ready. Get your coffee while it's hot. Get your cereal while it's cold. Also bring a bug jacket. We have to do another big day. We had to do a few big days of lake paddling. Once we're done this river section, we're gonna be bouncing off big lakes. I think we have about 200 kilometers of straight lake paddling over the next few days. Cross my fingers for favorable wind direction and clear passage. day in paradise. Thank you, wind. Oh 
Over the last 24 hours, the landscapes have really changed. A lot more rolling hills, like almost like pastures. Very, very limited trees. It's almost the full proper barrens other than just sparse random patches of pine. Once getting on the locker, it definitely started feeling like a different trip. A little more buggy, pretty rugged. We've arrived at Ptarmigan Lake, and it feels like a, a whole different world now that we're here. The landscape's all very flat. The horizons are really low. I don't know, it, all, it almost looks like if, if you took a step off the uh, other side of the, the horizon, you'd just fall off the face of the earth. It is so flat. Damn it, it's blowing my mind how flat this is. Every horizon just looks like a small little break wall holding all this water in. Oh. Holy shit, there's a ton of them. Muskox, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I keep counting. Going over the hill, it looks like. Ah. You have the net? Yeah. Because I could probably. <laughs> yes! Good scoop, brother. We got dinner. Okay, what are we gonna do with this guy? Jesus. <laughs> Alright, that's dinner. Yeah, boys. Sweet. Getting very close to finishing the lake for the day. We've been paddling our little hearts out. Ever since seeing the bison on the horizon, Every white rock or black rock or anything that's not green, we give a second look. Because it's so barren and flat here, it's an excellent spot to scope wildlife from far away. We've been lucky so far with our wildlife encounters. Hopefully we see a few more. We got to the next really large lake and we're feeling the same ominous cold wind that we felt on our artillery before running into all that ice. And this water is super cold too, so I really hope we don't hit more ice. We don't need any more delays like that. Hey Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Though a muskox did greet us on our way into this, this new lake. He was trapped on the island too. Can muskox swim? I don't know. That one kind of looks like it's behind us. It's still echoing. What's the call here? What's that? No. It's still about 3k to that beach, and we have to do about a kilometer and a half crossing. Get there in 45 minutes. It might be. That might be close.
know you got a little something in your teeth there, buddy. What is it? A little mosquito. <laughs> Last hour of paddling got very calm and then these big storms started developing behind us and it sort of split and all around us we have we have thunder showers and uh, we got a little rain on us but not much compared to what we're seeing in the horizon it's always good to get off the water when you hear thunder and lightning especially when you're paddling big open water crossings like this but i think we got a decent campsite for tonight yeah a little further we are truly in the Barrens. It's incredible. I, I, you think of Barren Lands, you just think flat, nothing. There's, there's something peaceful about that. The end of the world at the palm of my hand. It's a special place, and we're just getting started. I'm gonna say this is my favorite campsite yet. Probably the weather played a big part in that as well. Beautiful scenery, beautiful landscapes. Today we're gonna to be doing another large paddle day. This trip is about 850 to 900 kilometers. And because of time constraints back home, we're trying to do it in about 30 days. We're trying to make use of these large lakes. The last two days we've done 40 plus kilometers and we need to do similar today in the next few days as well. It's very repetitive motion. It's a grind, but it's part of the trip. We're covering lots of ground over these next few days, making sure our bodies stay limber and our minds stay sharp for the big lake crossings. We've been lugging around these two nice juicy logs for the last three days. Nice and dry, nice and big, can be split up into very small pieces. Us carrying around these logs is gonna allow us to keep the fires going for a little bit longer, helping us preserve fuel for the later part of the trip where wood is going to be very hard to find. We've had a very productive morning so far. Probably paddled about 13 kilometers in what I would say is like the perfect paddling conditions. Perfectly calm water. Our team now has a pretty big decision to make. It's one that could save us about seven kilometers worth of paddling, but it's a lot of big water crossings that we need to do. So the team right now is just gathering at a point on the hill up here to take a look at what those crossings look like. Something like that. Yeah. And like here, we're looking out to the, we got a clear shot to this point. And then I think, what, if there's assuming no ice, I think we're good to make this crossing. As opposed to coming around the back. And we're seeing potential ice out here. Yes. So hopefully, I think we'll, we'll know when we get here, but hopefully it's out here and not, it doesn't come into here. You see the far, far, far shore? Yeah. That's where we need to get to. Then between this point and the far shore, there's an, quite a big island. The original route had us going behind the island because it's the safe option, but because it's so calm, we're hoping we can just cut from that point to the island to the far shore. And that saves about seven kilometers.
we're way too close to comfort to this ice sheet that's out here. And we're coming around this island. The final point here, it looks like there's ice. And if we get iced out, we have to go all the way back around, which is about an additional six or seven kilometers. If we've got a spot to get through right now, we can't stop just based on the wind conditions. Like that, that ice could just come over, you know? Cross those fingers a little bit. It's gonna be tight. Yeah. Kind of looks like there's a little patch right here that looks thinner than the rest. Oh, we got this. We have had an absolutely fantastic day of paddling so far. We're just pulling over for lunch. We've knocked off about 24 kilometers already and it's only 130 so that's a great start to the day and the most kilometers that we've actually paddled before taking a lunch break now the downside to that is that we are back in ice territory thought we were leaving this behind on artillery we had a little bit of a scare on our big crossing thinking that we might not be able to actually do the shortcut that we wanted to take we were able to get through and where we're stopped for lunch right now, all in front of me here is just a sheet of ice that we're not sure how much further we're gonna be able to actually make it at this point. So we're eating some lunch, we're staying optimistic, we're hoping the shoreline will be open, and uh, I guess we're gonna find out shortly. Noah's still a little hungry after lunch. So you just... go put your hand in the water and you'll have a trout just come take it out of your hand, like feeding a bird. This is what all the trout are after. That's disgusting. So you're gonna take a bite of that or? It's actually pretty heavy. It's probably about a million bugs in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's the ration on the peanut butter? Keep her lean, keep her lean. Keep her lean, okay. That meat and peanut butter. Runway there. Yeah, like we have to go around that island, like that big mountain thing here. Okay, why don't we just pull in here? You wanna keep going? No, we can pull in here. Yeah, this is getting old. Yeah, it is getting old. It does open up in there, but not for a long way. Once again, day 10, we're stuck because of the ice. This is getting super old. As soon as we start getting momentum, like we we're, we're, we already had like 25, 30K for the day. And we're eager to keep going, but like, what can you do? Like, now we're, we're sort of stuck again and waiting until the ice to get out. And it's so frustrating. Like, I know there's nothing you can do about it, of course. But come on. Like, there's still so much ice. And it was already, we're, we're already pushing it so close too with the delays we've had earlier on in this trip because of ice to be able to complete the route that we originally planned out to do and now it's like well now what
<laughs> Gotta let him think he's winning. He just doesn't fit. Okay. Holy smokes. Nice little laker on a dry fly. Nice. The six box is a KD. <laughs> <laughs> oh Plus my God. dehydrated vegetables and bacon and Parmesan cheese and hot chili pepper. Oh my gosh. We made it past the ice. Definitely hit a low point when we saw that. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I, I thought we were going to be in a lot more trouble than we were, but we just worked hard and worked our way through the ice and got to the other side. It is frustrating though, but that's just part of of these trips is you, there's unknowns and uncertainties and you just gotta deal with them. It's a, it is what it is situation. But on the other side, we found this beautiful island site. And after a hard day, you just look around and you just, it, it's all worth it. It's so nice out here. I can't even explain it. The ups and downs throughout the day, the emotional roller coaster, it's all just part of the ride. There's ups and there's downs. You just gotta go with them. And dry? Yeah. Good morning. It's the morning of day 10. And yesterday we got through a sketchy ice section. And today we're hoping to get off this big lake, but we're gonna be heading over to the final large lake, which is Almer Lake. And we are very concerned that there's gonna be ice on that one too. So we reached out to our buddy Dave Green, who you guys might know from the Labrador series a couple years back. Point of the story is, is that we've made it to the George River. Who's at the home base and gave us an ice update. And it looks like there's still significant ice on the next lake. He gave us some info on some bays that are open. And one of the bays that's open, there's actually a fishing lodge on it. So we're gonna aim for that lodge, which is about 43 kilometers from here and hopefully he might have some information on best routes moving forward and it'd be cool just to, to check out his operation. Pray for no ice. Pray for no ice, come on guys. This ice this situation is getting out of control. It's mid-July, once we finish this final lake, Almer Lake, we're gonna have a lot of rivers and small lakes to travel, which we don't expect there to be any ice. For the next couple days, we just gotta get through it. Oh, man. <laughs> you think it's gonna work? I think it might. You hold her high and strong. And you gotta bring your right arm backwards a bit. Yeah. Never thought about setting uh, a sail up like this before. But this seems to be working well. It's like a, a poor man's sail. Yeah, poor man's sail. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we're sailing. This is like the full on sail experience. Quick, quick, get to the left, get to the left. Oh, shit. A little windier today, but.
but there's a little bit of a tailwind which we're able to harness with a tarp sail. Coming on to lunch, we've done about 20k, <laughs> working our way into the next big lake, Almer Lake. We're just in the narrows between the two. We've made it about 12 to 14 kilometers, I'm forgetting now, since lunch. We are on our way to the Almer Lake Lodge. We're hoping to get some more information about the ice conditions on this lake. I don't know, potentially stop by, see if maybe they have any beer, extra beer for a couple canoeists. I would love a blueberry pie. <laughs> blueberry pie. Here. Put your hand. <laughs> That's huge. Along our route, we stopped at this beach, and beaches are awesome spots for seeing animal tracks. And on this one, there's fresh grizzly bear tracks, wolf tracks, and moose tracks. I am really surprised we haven't seen a, a grizzly yet. They are, apparently there's a lot of them in this area. And you can tell by their footprints, they can get really big. Those racks just are ginormous. That's so cool. We haven't seen any signs of movement yet, but it does look like a really nice lodge. A few buildings up here and a beautiful beach for us to land our boat. Time to find out what we have in store or not in store for us. I want some blueberry pie. <laughs> he wants some blueberry pie. We saw some people up there. Yeah. Oh, here. oh yeah. What did you say, huh? Feels a little weird. Sorry, what was your name again? Kate. 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 Yeah. Okay, so yesterday was your first day end of the, for the year? Yeah. To the ice? Yeah, the ice, yeah. It opened up about four days ago. We were in Yellowknife waiting to kind of get the go ahead to come in. Was it late right here? Yeah. 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 How's your trip going? Oh, fantastic. But they opened the zone here. So they did an 11 hour uh, skidoo ride over here without proper equipment in February. So they came and they broke Fuel. In. We have gas gone, propane tanks gone. I just looked, I'm missing propane tanks. So they used the propane for their own heaters or whatever. So they just took our tanks. They used, uh, they took for sure one drum of gas. Uh, they broke into the other cabin and we're going to stay in the cabin assistance after we leave. You guys come through here. You probably come along this side here. We did, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is where I showed you where all that broken ice up was, and this yeah. is all iced up. This arm in here and all through here, this was all ice in that one solid picture. Yeah. This was all ice in here. Because we were kind of wondering if we might be able to sneak in through these chains to avoid that's a possibility avoid ice up but this was way. ice yesterday in here oh wow okay. this was ice yesterday and then the wind's blowing this way so it'll push this way here so this might be closed off on you you could try and sneak through here and portage a little bit if it was me i would go here on this is a big rock bluff back there we saw we can see it there, yeah, yeah you can see the big bluff back yeah, there yeah, so yeah, you, yeah. Could, you could be on this side and come across or you could sneak on this side and come across on either side of the bluff this was kind of all ice in here still. And this was all white in that picture. Williams Island was all white. This was all white. This here was all white. The McNeils have a lot of work to do before the first guests arrive tomorrow. So we offered our help in any way that we could. Graham, Kyle, and me are on the roof fixing a leak that happened over the last couple of years. And Alex is inside helping Patty prepare dinner. Sit beside her. I'll sit right here. Yeah. Well, oh, no, I thought we didn't want you guys uh, to sit there to see the water. This looks fantastic. Okay. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Oh my god. 
There is a huge storm. There's a huge storm coming through. Dude, this is wild. Man, look at that wall. The rain? Yeah. Definitely thankful for a cabin to be sleeping in tonight. Can say that. Can definitely say that. Man, there's already blue sky there for me. And every storm we've had is so ferocious and lasts like five to ten minutes then it's gone blue skies yeah yeah they're quick they, they hit fast okay but the biggest thing about the storm dude is the ice breaking potential yeah there is some ice breaking potential with the storm 100 percent Something else. It is the morning of day 11. We just had an incredible night stay at the Alamer Lake Lodge here on Alamer Lake. Kevin, Patty, and Kate graciously took us in for the night, gave us a warm place to sleep and some freshly cooked meals, and also helped us avoid a pretty big storm that rolled in last night that definitely would have been the biggest storm that we would have seen on this trip so far. Amazing hospitality, an amazing night to rest and recharge. We feel very grateful for that as well. The realization that we might not make it to Bathurst Inlet was very real this morning. Looking at the next few weeks, we still have a lot of hard work ahead of us, most notably the little known Contoido River, which we're going to have to track upstream for over 150 kilometers. The final chapter of the route has its descent the Mara River, but with the amount of uncertainty with the white water and portaging, alternating course to the larger Burnside River may save us the much needed time to get back on track to reach Bathurst Inlet. It seems to me like what kind of my preference is like it's possible that we could just switch gears to a Burnside plan but still be under this gun. It's just like pick a route what we perceive to be the nicest route like the boat we're most interested in and then just plug away like I don't know, I think the pace we've been doing is like sustainable but also a bit of a grind. It's like just pick away at like comfortable pace, do the fishing and do the, see the things we want to see and get as far as we can get. It's what we all wanted of this trip because this is a trip for, this is all our vacation. Yeah. And uh, we want to make sure we're all getting something out of it. But um, looking back, yeah, like this is a very ambitious route with little wiggle room and and the, that ice sort of yeah. delayed us enough mm. where we're, we're now playing catch up for the rest of the trip. And there's nothing we could do about that. We I mean, said three weeks late, you know. Yeah. Ten out of ten. Eleven out of ten. Eleven out of ten. It's like a beautiful beach, good swimming, flat ground to pitch a tent. Not a breath of wind. Sun is out. 9:25 p.m. Still got like three hours of daylight. We didn't talk much today, as I think we're all in our own minds, reflecting on what the next few weeks may hold. 
But if the rivers hold water and the weather stays calm, we still all have hope that we can make it to the Arctic Ocean. dead calm and all of a sudden the tent started shaking and we looked outside and this huge system is coming through. We're about to get smoked, we batten down the hatch. It's four o'clock in the morning and I think we're gonna get back in the tent. Nice wake up call this morning. If there's one thing that we know about storms up here is typically they haven't lasted long so hopefully this falls into the same category and this is just gonna hit us hard for a few minutes and then bugger off. Been about three hours since the start of the storm passed. As you'd expect, pretty windy, light rain. We'll probably have that for the rest of the day. We hope to get to the back river by lunch and get off these big lakes for good. Yesterday we had the grim realization that we do not have enough time to do the Mara River. We had too many hiccups at the start of this trip, along with me not planning enough wiggle room in our route, that it would have been way too ambitious to make that happen. I still think we could make it happen, but we would have to grind really, really hard. And being in such a beautiful spot, it is a fine balance between pushing each day and stopping to smell the flowers. It was really disappointing when we realized this because this route has been in the works for some time. Looking back, I'll reflect on, on planning these routes a little better by giving a little more wiggle room for conditions like that to happen. But we still have over two weeks out here and we're still gonna try to get down to Bathurst Inlet through the Burnside River. The Burnside is a larger vein that the mirror flows into that we would expect to have more water and less variables with, with bony conditions or technical rapids. It's gonna be a similar distance, so we still have to put in the hours each day, but we think there's a higher probability that we'll get to Bathurst Inlet by the Burnside River compared to the Mara River. We have a pretty significant bay crossing here with a direct side wind. And that's pulling up some decent waves here and big enough that it could tip us. So what I'm doing in the back is I'm zigzagging the boat to try to hit the waves at about a 45. The least stable you can be with big waves is if it hits you directly on the side. Talking about the island here? Yeah. yeah.
not good. down and smoked me in the head and then I just fell forward but now we have a canoe with no yoke that's gonna need some repairing and I'm just trying to shake off this headache we made it to the back river finally we're going down river now but I think we're gonna call it. We're just gonna look for a place to set up camp. We just need to reset and start it again tomorrow. survival set up here. The wind is not let up, the rain is still torrential. There's not good camping here, so we, we, set, up, we set up our tents amongst the rocks. We've got a pretty serious survival setup going on right now. The winds have been howling all day and it has not stopped raining. We just tried to find a spot as quick as possible to pull over for camp. All the guys were worried about getting cold uh, just because we we're standing around trying to figure out what to do. The river we tried to paddle down is looking super bony so you know we weren't getting to any new places quickly so we just had to kind of make it work at the side of the river and we are tucked into this little pool of rocks here just trying to wait out the rain and the wind and and just hope that things turn around for us here times like these you really need to dig deep out here the, the four foot swells yeah. it was crazy like there was times when i was like looking back to check in on you guys and like the waves were so big that there was no sight of your canoe Definitely the biggest swell I've ever uh, paddled in by far. Yeah. And just biggest storm. It's insane. There was another island blocking us, kind of, on our way to that island. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, I feel like we didn't have the coverage anymore, and it was like yeah. hefty waves. Yeah. There was just a big wind tunnel coming right down there. Yeah. How's your uh, neck and head feel? I feel much better now. Like, honestly, as soon as we had the tent set up, I, I was already feeling better. Those wraps helped, like... Yeah, yeah. I feel fine. Like I was just like out of my game after that. Yeah. yeah. And then I just felt myself. I was slowing down, so I just felt myself getting cold and. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we set up when we did. Yeah. Yeah. And that we're set up. Yeah. Looks like the storm has passed, mostly. The wind has totally shifted and it's blasting up the river. It's really cold today. Good opportunity to dry all our gear. We don't really know what the game plan is yet. We're gonna have some coffee and discuss as a team. The other news of the day is looking down river. It, it is really bony. We'll probably have to portage this entire first section. It's about a kilometer. So we just broke a tent. 
pole. Just had the tent up, trying to dry it out. I don't really know what happened, but wind caught it and we broke the pole here. Thankfully today and not last night, it was a rainstorm. How we're going to fix it is we're going to make a splint with a peg. It's, hard on, it's real close to the seam here. You can see where it normally pops out. So these two, unfortunately, were going to be welded together. We were thinking of putting something inside, but we didn't quite have the right diameter peg. It would work, but it's not great. Well, oh, you're on my toe. You're on my oh. Okay. It's been a short run. Thank you for your miles. Yeah. Um, maybe start with duct taping a bit at each end. Do we do we want to just tape this in, in on its own first? Sure. Just get like a wrap on that. You just get way more, you can get it tight because you get the, the, leverage. the leverage off the knot. You just throw a loop in like that. And then you just keep repeating the process. And then you get all this amazing leverage. So you can get it super tight. Tighter than you could ever do it without it. Clove hitch here. Okay. This reminds me of taping a hockey stick. river is not letting up. I don't think we paddled any of it so far. There's a huge section coming up that is just easier to portage the 1.5 kilometers around. Morel's really low right now with the group. Progress is very slow. just got to camp for the night. We put in a full day's work and we got five kilometers. This river is bone dry. I don't know if we paddled more than a kilometer. We did a lot of tracking and dragging the boats down the creek and then we started just portaging and we finished with about a 1.5 kilometer portage. We just dumped all our stuff at the end. There's a small lake here and the river continues on the other side but we decided to stop here because we don't want to see what our fate looks like tomorrow just yet. We just want to enjoy the evening. We managed to gather up enough firewood to have an, a fire this evening. We didn't think we'd be able to have fires this north because of the lack of trees, but there's a lot of small willows, enough to have a few boils anyways. I don't know what you call it, kind of one pot magic. Uh, dehydrated ground beef, dehydrated chives, dehydrated onions. There's some dehydrated um, kind of mixed vegetables and at the very bottom there's mushrooms. So I'll rehydrate it all, add a little taco seasoning, and then cornbread with dehydrated um, jalapenos. Holy smokes. So, yeah. There's a full pot there. Full pot, so easy, so light, it's amazing like how light it is, um, but we'll all be well fed in about 30, 40 minutes. 
so. This is the first section of the back river that empty out to a significant lake. And if it's deep enough, the hope is there might be a few Arctic grayling there. We're gonna go give her a try. This is also the first time of this trip where the moss is starting to look like potential butt wipes again. Earlier on, it was way too crispy. It was loose and light caribou moss or reindeer moss. What do you guys think? If it's deep enough, I'm thinking there's gonna be a, a grayling or two here. Fish on! I don't know what it is. Oh, the lake trout. This is the smallest lake trout on the trip so far. Just a little guy. All right, I'm gonna take the hook off and try it again. Oh man. Too shallow, the hunt continues. Yo, what did you got? Just a lake trout. Just a lake trout? <laughs> yeah. The smallest lake trout of the trip so far, actually. Really? Really? Yeah. I thought it was a grayling because I was so shallow. Did you get anything else? No, that was it. Oh man. Oh, you get a you get a prize for the size of your meals. I figured we'd all be hungry. <laughs> <laughs> We're like thrashing through the thunder every day. Hello, world. This is the Arrow Bros with our song "Rocky Back River." The Rocky Back River, the Rocky Back River, the Rocky Back River, we go. The Rocky Back River, the Rocky Back River, the Rocky Back River, we go. Yeah. So we know on a macro scale, these landscapes were formed from glaciers about 10,000 years ago. But on a micro scale, these landforms are formed from periglaciation. And that actually has nothing to do with glaciers. It's landforms that are formed from frost and cold weather, specifically permafrost and the active layer above the permafrost. The permafrost limits a lot of growth in the area, as we talked about earlier, about what really defines the barren lands. Another defining characteristic of these landscapes are all the mounds that we see along these barrens. And that has to do with the amount of peat and sphagnum almost work as insulators for ice lenses within the active layer above the permafrost. Another cool fact about these ice lenses is they continue to grow over time. Similar to rolling a snowball down a hill that continues to get snow on it, ice lenses continue to pull in moisture from the soil around it, creating a larger layer. And these tend to form under rocks because of the thermal change between the rock and the soil. And as they grow, it pushes the rock to the surface and that's called frost heave. On the map of the upper section we did yesterday, there was no indication of any rocks. It was just looked like a clear river. So we were stumped. And on this lower section, it actually shows rapids. So I don't know if that's gonna mean more bony conditions or actually these rapids are gonna start to pick up and they're gonna be fun to run. Hopefully it's a later.
we're approaching the next set of rapids and we're crossing our fingers there's enough water to paddle or at least do something that we don't have to portage right up against shore First downriver run of the trip. Yeah. I'm gonna push us forward if you can just push off of that so that we don't go left. Can't go more than five feet without getting stuck on a rock. When you go to step, it's like four feet deep. Oh my god. This is marked as a rapid on the map. Life jacket. Used for when you're in water. Look at this. Not water. Rock. <laughs> oh my god. I need a goddamn cup of Joseph! That's how I feel right now. I need goddamn coffee and I need a goddamn river or a goddamn lake. It's so good. <laughs> it's not open. You want me to do an inspection? Oh! Quick inspection. Okay. It is cracked, so you are getting kind of like a subpar <laughs> sesame look, snap. Look, this thing is covered in shit. Yeah, but I would say that that actually, when it's in the Here, candy you bag... you can also hold it in trust. Yeah, it is licorice. It is indeed I, licorice. I, uh, consent to trading. <laughs> wow. On the... You, Folks, you saw it here first, <laughs> on the back river. First trade. It's official. <laughs> this is big news. Nice. Need to be careful with this yoke. Strategically wearing my helmet this time, just in case she breaks again. It's gonna grind. And right now, there's no end in sight. I just gotta keep pushing as far as we can until we make a decision about where we're gonna get picked up.
become pretty apparent that we're not going to make it to Bathurst Inlet. This river has been an absolute slog. And then once we're done this river, we have to go up the Contoido River. The morale of the team is really low right now. I think everyone's asking themselves, what's the slogging for? Do we really want to spend the next two weeks grinding up river? I don't know what the team's going to decide here. It looks like we have another 1.5 kilometer portage. I guess we'll just see how the team feels. We're out here. We're trying. We'll figure something out. We just don't know what that is yet. Are you confirming the distance? Yeah, it's 1.8. There's like a few sections that we could potentially like meander through, but I feel like eventually we're just gonna get choked up and we'll just be put like we'd have to pull out and put back in multiple times anyways, so we might as well just carry. How do you guys feel right now? Really good. <laughs> <laughs> um eh. <laughs> not good. Not good. We're questioning what we're doing out here. It's a, it's a tough pill to swallow, but like, I just, yeah, I'm kind of done with this. <laughs> this is like getting ridiculous. Set after set. Just for what? It's a lot. What is a canoe trip? It's a bit of a philosophy. But then after a while, it appears that you actually are on some form of a hiking trip because <laughs> you spend more time outside of your canoe than within it. And if you're dragging your canoe over long periods of time on the, on the outside of the water, is it still considered a canoe trip or is it a hiking trip? Whoa! <laughs> It's or whatever they call the it. Gourmet biscuits right here. <laughs> Last year we took an oven on the Mackenzie. I wanted to show you guys something that I found pretty cool. There's a lot of small plants on the tundra, and one of them is Labrador tea. But the lab tea here is a micro version. I don't know much about plants in the Arctic or in general, but it is fascinating how much life is just an inch above the surface. When you look at the ground, it's just full of these micro plants. And it is really diverse. You have lots of different types. It's not just one specific type. We pulled over here to Icy River, which is a small tributary that flows into Muskox Lake. Now we're just gonna go explore what's around the corner here. We're about 10 feet above where the, where the water line is right now. And all these rocks, have been deposited here from the spring melt. So this river would have been gushing. And imagine the power needed. To... Oh! This could be a false alarm. So 
See that's flaking like a book? Yeah. Muscovite is a very shiny mineral and it often looks like things that are a little more valuable. Like sometimes you'd look at this and think it's silver, gold, but it's it's a pretty standard mineral in the rocks. This is oftentimes when you're looking at like a granite and you see a, like a shine, it's the muscovite. Just saying hello. Got the crab walk. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? <laughs> Yo, you're like a hood ornament right now. Oh, stuck the landing. We have made it to Muskox Lake after a big grind on the back river. Tomorrow we are going to make it to the other side of Muskox Lake where there is the named Muskox Rapids. And we are hoping that those are flowing enough that we can actually run them. And then from there, we would be into the Contoido River, working our way upstream to Contoido Lake. We know that if we get to Contoido River and it's anything like the Back River, we have a lot of work ahead of us. It'll be a deciding point tomorrow. Tomorrow's really gonna be where we're gonna have to make the decision about, uh, about what we do going forward. In the meantime, we've got a great place here on Muskox Lake. We've built a little bit of a shelter uh, using some loose rocks that were floating around and uh, tarp, and we're pretty cozy in there right now. So I'm gonna get out of the rain right now and head back into the cozy shelter where Noah's making us some dinner. Can't complain with that. The morale was really low after those two days of portaging. And we really needed a day just to relax and enjoy ourselves with not too much hard work. We really don't know how far we're gonna get. It really depends on how bony the river is leaving this lake. We're all on the same page. We don't wanna leave. We wanna spend the time out here. We just don't know what that's gonna look like right now. Good morning. Good morning. My fort's still alive. Morning, Graham. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think overall, the morale is a lot higher now than it was 24 hours ago. We made a little tarp fort with a bunch of rocks in a nice little nook away from the wind. And it was exactly what we needed last night and this morning. Earlier on in this trip, we were talking about how this area is known for its diamond mining. There's also a handful of other rare earth metals that are mined up here. One of them that we all know is gold. And gold is associated with quartz and quartz veins. And here we can see a small example of what a quartz vein looks like. A quartz vein starts as a hydrothermal fluid, which is a liquid that is being heated up from being deep in the Earth's crust. Over time, this liquid circulates through cracks and faults, and as it's moving, it dissolves minerals from the surrounding rocks to create a rich mineral fluid. One of the main minerals that dissolves out of these rocks is silica, which is the main building block of quartz. As it continues to move towards the Earth's surface, the fluid gets cooler and these minerals start to precipitate out, turning into the quartz veins we know and love. Quartz veins are associated with gold because in this fluid you can consider silica and gold to be part of the same parent rock. So generally, if you do see a quartz vein in any sort of rock, there's a probability that there's gold in there as well. I'm not saying you're gonna find gold nuggets, but there is generally an association with quartz and gold. <laughs> I think this is a big one. Gosh. 
and that's the biggest one in a long time. We were trolling and it got shallow. So I was just trying to reel it in. Dude, that's a big fish. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah, she's a oh. decent size. Oh man. Which is 33 again. But just not as girthy as the last one. I don't know whether to pull him in the boat right now or just like, should we just paddle over the shore and then... Uh, dispatch him? Dispatch him, yeah. This is a dinner trout. We have just arrived at the north end of Muskox Lake just at the top of a set of rapids known as Muskox Rapids. Muskox Rapids is a five kilometer set of rapids that we don't really want to dive into until we know what the water conditions are going to be like. Today we are going to be hiking Muskox Rapids to figure out what the water conditions look like and essentially make a decision about what our next step is for this trip. We're just having some lunch right now. Noah's making us some wraps and we're gonna gather our stuff and, and go for a hike for the rest of the afternoon to essentially figure out what our fate is gonna be on this trip. Good first signs on the river. It appears there's actually water flowing and a lot less rocks and boulders. Still another 3.5 kilometers for us to go take a look at, but the first kilometer or so is looking pretty good. Guys, this river is looking primo. We're gonna scout all the way to the Contoido, but this river has enough flow that we can get down there with our canoes rather than do the four and a half kilometer hike. This is great news. So we're out here fly fishing for Arctic grayling on dry flies. And what I'll be using is a size 12 black gnat. We're seeing a lot of these grayling rise and it looks like a similar size black fly is bouncing off the surface, so if we can match the hatch, we might be able to catch a grayling or two. Let's give it a try. So sick. dark and cold. Uh, it's 
freezing. This has been the coldest and windiest morning yet. It's probably about eight degrees. Gray skies, hard winds. We're gonna keep a strong eye on the weather and make sure we don't get into ourselves into a similar situation that we did a few days ago with that heavy rainstorm. We're packing up camp, it's about 7.30 in the morning. Boys, oh boys, it's gonna be another cold one out there today, boys. Got to get them all wrapped up, ready to go. Oh. <laughs> Rick, this is our last section of white water. Too bad we don't have like 300 kilometers of this. I know. On this entire trip, now it looks like we only have this five kilometers of downriver paddling. Not the way I like to set up trips, but we. For a lot of reasons, we're not making it to Bathurst Inlet, so we're really trying to savor this set of rapids. And it does seem pretty technical, too. Toito. We made it to the confluence of the Back River and the Contoido River. This is a big milestone for us. We've been talking about this for days. It feels really good to be here. And that was also some really fun whitewater that we've been itching for for two weeks. Our plan is to start tracking our canoes against the current, going up the Contoido towards Contoido Lake. This is a big moment for us right now because with current water conditions and river conditions in general being very boulder strewn, we don't really know what to expect up ahead. Contoido Lake would have been the headwaters of the rivers we would have taken to Bathurst Inlet. It's about 150 kilometers upriver, and we're definitely going against the grain on this one. In 1821, the infamous Sir John Franklin and his 18 men attempted to survey the Northwest Passage, but after running low on rations and good weather, they had to abandon their plans and find a way home. Their return journey involved nearly three months of wandering through the barrens, battling starvation, exposure, and mutiny. The Contoido River proved to be a major crux in their journey when Franklin nearly drowned and lost all his notes trying to cross the river. Other than this historic account, we couldn't find much information on the Contoido or its character. This added to its mystery and our curiosity.
So we have made it to camp here on day 17. Found a beautiful little pull-off spot after a long day of tracking our canoes up the Contoido River. The exciting thing is that we are, as the crow flies, under a kilometer to the Nunavut border. And that's some exciting news for us. We've been pushing hard, traveling through the Northwest Territories at this point, and it's gonna be some big news for us to, to actually cross over into Nunavut. For dinner tonight, Kyle and Graham are whipping us up some falafels. It's Middle Eastern night here on the river. We were hoping to be able to dry out because we haven't really seen much sun in the last like five days and it was hinting like we might get some tonight, but it is kind of spitting rain right now. So now I'm gonna go pack all my stuff away to make sure nothing gets wet. As of yesterday, the conditions weren't too bad. Tracking seemed to be the best option with the odd paddling through, through stiller sections. But we're gonna have a few more days of this before reaching the big lake. So we made it to another big milestone on this trip. We are currently at the border of Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. I'm here in the Northwest Territories, but Kyle over there drinking his coffee is in Nunavut. There's no border control here. It's pretty easy to access Nunavut from this route. So if you guys want to get to Nunavut, suggest you guys take the Contoido River up. That's our cabin. We're having Nunavut. The sun finally came out, it's sort of the winds. We just had some lunch and just had a little rest before we have some paddling to do in the headwind. There are white caps out there. What a ride! Oh, there's some winds, eh? Yeah, maybe it's tied off for now. We can bring her up later. Yo, 
This is the first time in like seven days we've had wind and sun and we have a lot of clothes that need drying. So we pulled off the river a little early today just to enjoy this weather and dry all our stuff. Beautiful campsite here beside the set of rapids. We're about, we're about 150 meters from the lake. All this is pretty gnarly. Tomorrow morning we're gonna portage all our stuff right to the lake not mess around with the section. This is such a welcome change to the weather. Noah made me pack these shorts at the beginning of the trip. He's like, yo, I might throw in shorts because it might be sunny out there. And I wasn't even thinking about bringing shorts. And then for the last 10 days, I've been thinking, why did I bring these shorts? Well, today we got some beautiful weather. Shorts are out. We don't have bugs right now. It doesn't get better than this. Graham is gonna attempt the first cast in the eddy beside camp. No cuts, one cast. Pressure's on. He's on! Looks like a grayling. I didn't get it out, but first cast. First cast, nice grayling. Oh! <laughs> Beauty grayling. Look at that. Awesome, I'll let him go. All right, we saw Graham do it. Now I gotta give it a try. This is exactly what you wanna look for when you're trying to fish. Moving water, eddying around, and creating a food hole where bait fish or other food sources sort of get stuck in. And the fish just wait there and sit and then make their move when they see the bait come through. Let's give it a go. Oh, I just saw a grayling swipe at it. Oh, watch this, guys. Oh, he missed it again. He missed it again. There it is. A beautiful grayling. Look at those colors. Oh. Beautiful fish. This is just too much fun. This is just too much fun. All right, got the fly rod out. I'm gonna try a fly I've tied and I've never caught a fish on. It's a weighted leech. I don't think there's leeches up here, but maybe it looks like a falling Arctic grayling with a orange cap on its head. That was a hit. Oh, that's a hit. That's a hit. Oh, come on, buddy. I'm all stuck in the rock. Oh man, come on, stay on, stay on, stay on. All right, we got him on the reel now. Oh yeah, that's a grayling. That's a grayling on the leech pattern.
Oh baby! Going for a morning bite. You see that jump? Oh, this is a good one. I think it's my biggest yet. Come on, buddy. Oh, my God. Is a huge railing. That is my biggest grilling yet. So sweet. Day 19 here. I knew it was gonna be a good day because I woke up and I was hot in my sleeping bag. As soon as I got out of my tent, I looked in the pool right in front of camp, a grailing jumped caught three grilling instantly. We have a lot of lake paddling today too. Things are looking pretty good. Graham, does this mean it's gonna be a sunny day? I hope so. <laughs> this is the first time I've applied sunscreen in what feels like weeks. It's nice to have the sun come out, dry things out. We dried out a bunch of stuff last night. There's no getting away around the fact that the sun just boosts morale quite a bit, I would say. Clothes went back in the clothes bag instead of in the barrel with all the wet stuff. So, 100% reset. Clean underwear today. With the last little bit of sun, we also had the chance to boost our solar panels, which have all been pretty depleted along with our electronics for filming. I think the play this morning is portage around the final 150 meters or so of rapids. Then we'll have to paddle for about 10 kilometers or so, which is gonna be a nice change from all the tracking we've been doing. We're tracking very boulder strewn sets of rapids with a lot of big boulders and deep pools. One of the techniques we like to use is holding onto the side of the boat while you walk so that if you do slip, you can put most of the weight on the boat. We have a few of these sets today marked as rapids on the maps. It doesn't look too bad as of yet. Keep going. Wow.
We have one more pinch in the river today before we get to the big part of the lake and we're gonna try to muscle up and just paddle this one straight up. Conditions are perfect. Light breeze, almost no clouds, and a lot of sun. It's also not really hot either. I don't like when it gets like too hot. When it gets too hot, I lose some energy, but this is perfect. We were just paddling along an unnamed lake before Thistle Lake here, and Graham has hooked into a massive, what we think could be a big fish. Oh, I see a flash. Yeah, it's looking pretty big. Yo, that's a big fish. Make sure not to play them too uh, quickly, like we're gonna need to tire them out. Do you want me to paddle you over to shore? Yeah, maybe. Oh. Oh. That is a big it just he's so big that you can probably get a good hand on his tail and it helps control the body shakes. Yeah. Oh my god, what a beautiful fish. He's a heavy one too. That's amazing. Put it up a good fight. And just hold him by the tail and hold him by the tail until he uh, kicks off on his own. Nice. Oh. That's what you love to see. Yo, how's that? Sweet. Yeah, still not the biggest one we've had on the trip, but that by far that was the best fight I've had. That was awesome, man. Just, you played that so well. He just felt heavy, you know. He just didn't didn't want to come in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I caught one other 30 incher, but that one was definitely felt a bit more girthy than the one I just caught there. So that was 30 inches? 30 inches, yeah. Man, that's awesome. Oh, what fun. It's giving me like uh, flashback to the back. Flow, but like so shallow that you can't paddle or drag and it's scaring me. From far away, this looks really, really bony and too shallow to drag but perception is weird out here because there are no obvious features and it's hard to tell how big things are. And coming right up to the river here, it does look like there's about three feet of flow. And that's way more than we need for tracking, so we're good. Looking down about a kilometer, big white water. Don't know what we're gonna do when we get to that. Might be a portage, but I think that's tomorrow's problem. Yo, Graham hooked into a nice 30 incher around the corner back there. We had to pull over, get to shore. It was like a nice fight. GoPro footage underwater, like, was, oh my God. really it's... sealed the deal on all of the footage you, you could have Yeah. So we did a scout mission. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that. Not good. Like this first section is a little bony. Yeah. But once you reach the, the bluff, it's deep enough to track. It's like, a, it's three feet deep and you can just walk along shore most of the time. Okay. And then way down, there's like a big thunderous whitewater section. Okay, so it sounds like we'll be in and out of the water kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Be nice if we can just walk some of it. <laughs> just so that we're not portaging 5k. Yeah, definitely. But if if that's, if that's it's sketch, then... Do you think it's like a portage right out of here, or could we... No, I think we, we can get to the, the white water. Yes. Okay. Well, we're at the point of the trip where our hands have been exposed to the elements for so long that mine are, my cuticles are starting to bleed and I'm starting to get sun blisters and the skin looks like leather. And they kind of hurt too. It goes to show that having hand maintenance is pretty important out here.
first cast in a new spot. The old leech pattern. Let's see if we can get it. I'm on a grailing. Look at that. Oh. Beautiful fish. I'm gonna try one more cast. Look at that. Beautiful fish. Oh. Oh no. Just coming back from the fishing at the hole over there and I noticed a perfect frost heave rock. Remember a couple episodes ago, we were talking about ice lenses in the active zone above the permafrost pushing rocks up. Look at this, this is like textbook. You could see even the soil around it that got pushed up as well. And look at this. This is not, there's no reason it should be like this. Just a little periglaciation in action. Got the coffee going, got the day snacks and rations up. Every morning, one of us gets up before the others and makes coffee and breakfast, and then calls the others out once everything's ready. It allows three of the guys to sleep in and wake up to fresh coffee rather than have to do all those morning chores. This is my morning. This morning time is also great just to have some peace and quiet and uh, just, just hang out. Black flies are really bad this morning. If the wind doesn't pick up, today is gonna to be a torrential downpour of black flies. I didn't know that I just left my side door open. And I was wondering why they were starting to fly into my ear. I don't know how it's possible, but I was just drinking coffee and there's like three in my butt crack. <laughs> For the last almost two weeks, we've been watching these cloudberries grow and waiting until they were finally ripe enough to pick. Cloudberries are one of my favorite berries to pick when we're out on the land. Such a delicious little berry. There's fields of cloudberries here that are, are almost ripe and today they're starting to get ripe. Oh wow, it's soft and plump. Mmm. First fresh fruit I've had in two weeks. Three weeks. Mm-hmm. It's like, you can see really damn far.
So from our scout yesterday, I think we're gonna go to the right side. There looks to be enough water to track, but we're only seeing the first kilometers. So it's a five kilometer set. It might be an all day event. We'll see. Got some gold in there? No. What about this piece? Not gold enough? No. So we've been tracking our canoes all morning and made it through some pretty hairy sets. We just got to a big set of rapids that has quite a bit of elevation gain and there's a lot of rocks. So we're gonna go take a look, scout it out, and just see what our best options are in terms of getting around this. Is it gonna be worth dragging the canoes over this or would we be better off portaging around? We have to portage. Dang it. Dang it, boy. If I go where you are, then you go down there and I can try to position it. Ready? Let go! Let it go! Ah, Did you do something different here? The only other thing I would say is like I got it a little bit further. Like I, I was like right down here. We're at a really technical rapid that we have to track up right now. The boys are on their third attempt here. This one's gonna be the charm. Some tough maneuvers out here. I think I'm not going to push it out as far. Yeah, pull her! We have officially made it to our camp here on Thistle Lake on day 20. 
We had a tough day today, tracking our canoe up river. We didn't get very far, but it was a lot of hard work. An honest day's work. We ended a little early today, which gives us the opportunity to do some laundry, go for a swim, catch some fish, and just really enjoy ourselves out here. It's really important taking the beauty of these places that we're, uh, that we're traveling through. <laughs> that fin, beautiful. Whoa. For dinner tonight, I made a pasta dinner and I just wanted to show you guys really quickly how I pack this and what it looks like before and what it looks like once it's actually rehydrated. I pre-cooked all of my shell noodles and dehydrated them so that it cooks a little bit faster. Dehydrated ground beef, and this is really cool, a dehydrated pasta sauce that's like really flaky and it's just all packed in here. That's two jars of pasta sauce just into a little Ziploc. Then I take all of these ingredients, add water, and you have yourself something that looks like this. Almost like you made it fresh at home. Mmm. Oh my god. Really good. Really good. I was craving some pasta. Coffee and breakfast are ready. Come get it while it's hot. It is the morning of day 21. Can't believe I'm saying that right now. Seems like just yesterday we were starting this trip. At the same time, some of those days also seem like a very long time ago. We are currently on Thistle Lake and we would like to at least get to Migration Lake and potentially maybe to the start of the portage going into Gurkha. Today should be a little bit more paddling for us, which will be nice. Yesterday, all we did was track and portage the canoe. Change is nice out here. You grow to appreciate that. One thing that has changed is there is definitely a lot more black flies out here. That might be one of the changes that I don't know if I'm quite as happy about, but aside from that, excited for a day of paddling and uh, just to do something different for the day. That's what you like to see. Watch out, they might dive bomb us. We're out in the middle of the lake. There's a small island with all these pushed up rocks. It almost looks like it's man-made. But all these rocks got pushed here through big storm surges and ice. We're just gonna explore this a bit. There's two local Arctic terns uh, that are a little pissed that we're here, but we'll uh, we'll keep our distance. never know it's here unless he came up. It's crazy. Yeah, who would have thought? It's like soft too.
Best lunch out here. Simple yet effective. We are currently hanging out on one of the coolest islands that I've ever camped on in my entire life. Today's plans got a little sidetracked. We were planning on making it to Migration Lake. Instead, we came across a beautiful island site. We were just paddling along, saw this really rocky island, decided to pull over. We hiked up to the top and realized that there was the ultimate tent pad on top. Absolutely beautiful sight and our bodies can definitely use the break. So we're gonna take a rest day today and then start up hard again tomorrow. The guys are just reading some books. I'm gonna do some journaling for a little while and just hang out and enjoy the sun. I'm just getting ready to set up camp here for the night and I thought I'd take a quick minute to run you guys through our main gear bag. This is a waterproof dry bag. Very first thing that comes out is our tent. We've got our main tent and our fly separated by two separate dry bags. If you have a rainy day and you have to pack up your wet fly, you can keep it separate in, a dr in its own dry bag inside the main dry bag and not have water leak out and get everything else wet inside the bag. Our tent poles, our dry jackets, and then finally, clothes bags for each Noah and I in their own dry bags. Inside these dry bags also has each of our sleeping bags and our sleeping pads. Just fit into these 30 liter bags. The very last piece that we keep in here is our maps, which are double sealed inside of uh, a Ziploc here. Maps that we're not currently using on the go are, are staying dry in the bottom of this bag. Yes, this is a dry bag and could keep all of our stuff dry if we just put it all inside of here. Water can still get inside of this bag. So by putting dry bags inside of that dry bag, it helps ensure that none of this stuff is gonna actually get wet. That way you know when you are cold and wet that you are for sure gonna have a warm and dry place with some dry clothes for yourself and a dry sleeping bag when it comes time to uh, set up camp at night. That's our system here and it's uh, worked really well for us and again, really efficient because it fits two guys gear into one big bag that can be uh, easily portaged probably with a few other things. Depleted. <laughs> Depleted. I feel you burn, right? Oh. Okay. I will raise one berry. Two berries. I don't know. I'm gonna fold it. This is probably one of my favorite campsites of the trip. It was just so unexpected, like to pull up, middle of the day, we weren't really planning on stopping yet, and then to climb up some rocks just by fluke, and then find like 
the ultimate campsite. It changed all of our plans and we ended up staying the night. It was, it was perfect. Feel well rested and uh, ready for the grind today. to Migration Lake. Whoa. No way. Is that ice? Yeah. That's so much ice. Oh my god. That's exactly where we're going. Welcome to Migration Lake. Oh, damn. What is that over there? Yeah. What do you is think? Ice? Goddamn ice in almost August. Isn't that where we're going? We think that there's a good chance that that's where we're going. Yes. <laughs> yes, ice. Ice and air whiskey. I have to luge up this river. Yeah. If that's the case. We'll be the bobsled team. We just made it to Migration Lake after a small one kilometer section of tracking. The very first thing that we see when we get to the top of this set of rapids is more ice. It's been a recurring theme on this trip is just constantly running into ice. This does look like it could potentially be in the direction that we're heading, so fingers crossed it doesn't interfere with us at all and it's maybe just at a shoreline nearby where we need to go. Holy smokes. So you guys can see what's behind me here. We ran into some more ice. And this is a lot different. This looks like multi-year ice. And it is late July, guys. And it's gonna start getting cold in about six weeks here. So this snow is not going anywhere. I might sleep here tonight. It's damp and cold. Oh, seriously low friction. We're just gearing up for a first for us. We're gonna be portaging like sled dogs using this glacier as our route. We're gonna drag the canoes, see how this goes. We know this section of river is about five kilometers. We don't know how far this ice extends, but we're gonna start going and see where it takes us. Oh. Come on! Go down to make it! Oh, we're gonna make it! Ah! Ah!
the ice didn't go that far. So now we had to change tactics, pulled all our stuff out of the canoes, and we're gonna portage about 4.5 kilometers. That number doesn't even sound real right now, but we're just gonna chip away at it and see what happens. Some really strong winds. When the canoe's over your head, you're like a big kite. I'm also sporting the canoe with the broken yoke that has been feeling pretty solid, but fingers crossed it stays like that. The boys are stopped up ahead and they seem to be looking at something. We're in the middle of this 4.5 kilometer portage and we stumbled upon a really cool geological feature that we've been talking about over the last few episodes. Permafrost. This is a great example here of what permafrost looks like. Permafrost is defined as frost that has been in the ground for more than two years. That is like concrete. That is like freaking concrete. So how this works, you have your permafrost here and you have your active layer here. This active layer here has things that we call ice lenses, which cause the frost heave. And in the winter, this upper layer may freeze as well, but then in the summer it melts, hence the active. But this is permanent, hence the permafrost. I've never actually seen permafrost to this extent too, so this is really cool. I've only seen it in textbooks like this. We chipped off a 4.5 kilometer portage after lunch today. We did it pretty fast too. We're down to two loads. It's about dinner time, it's about six o'clock and we don't want to move anymore. So we're just going to camp right here at the end of the portage, get some food on the go, get the camp set up and uh, crash. I'm going to put on my sandals because my feet have been really moist all day. It's not a pleasant feeling. I feel haggard. <laughs> it's been about 10 days or so since the, uh, the pole was fatefully broken after the perfect storm. Besides the shape of the tent being a little distorted, I'd say it's holding in pretty good. We're still sleeping. We've had a couple other windy days, a couple other rainstorms, and uh, it's still kicking. We can't fold the pole down completely so it goes in the shotgun case. Um, and without fail, every time I set up the tent, I have to go and get the shotgun case because I forget that we don't have the pull. But uh, yeah, it's still working.
Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. It is the morning of day 23. We woke up to some rain this morning. Just a little pitter patter on the tent. Luckily Graham had a nice little shelter set up with a tarp for breakfast this morning. The rain is holding off for now. So hopefully that's, that's the case going forward. Bugs are out. Definitely the bugs are out this morning. If you catch one first cast, I'll give you a dollar. If you don't catch one first cast, you give me a dollar. Graham, do you accept the deal? You're on. Here we go, first cast. Looking good for Kyle, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> oh, you didn't land it! You didn't land it! I still get the dollar, I think. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Graham, you think this is a big one? This might be my biggest one yet. So, the biggest one was 30 inches. Here he comes, though. There he is. We're barbless, so any head shake. Loosen it at this point. I can uh, maybe. Okay. Quick measure? Yeah. Here, grab your other hand. You're yeah, going over 30. Oh! Oh! Oh, 35 and a half! <laughs> no, 30. Go right on the, right on Are the tip. Are you right on the tail? tail? Right on the tip of the tail. 35. Though, just over, though. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. Hold that bad boy up. Oh, it's heavy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It is heavy, man. <laughs> Unreal. Crazy. Look at the size of its eyes. Maybe walk him forward a little bit to where it's a little bit deeper. Yeah, start to move. goes. Man, that was awesome. What a fish. <laughs> Sweet. Nice. What a fish. One of the biggest fishes I've ever caught, I think. Definitely the biggest trout I've ever caught. Wow. It's exhilarating. The goal of today is to paddle Gurkha Lake and to get to the next river section that goes into Pellet Lake. At that point, we're going to be very close to the Contoida Lake. Uh, which is kind of our new goal now, given all the delays that we had. Based on this last river section, it's going to be interesting to see what we have up ahead. Not much water flowing through this river here. We're hoping that somehow that there's a little bit better flows on the other river. So we're just going to see what the day has in store for us. We're going to that point. small one. The fishing has just been insane on Gurkha Lake so far. Oh, 
We got up to about a 10 kilometer stretch of river here that's looking extremely dry. All this land that we're standing on at one point was underwater and we've been dealing with this over the last week is low water conditions. And we're gonna have to figure out a way how we're gonna pick apart the next 10 kilometers of very shallow bony white water. I don't see anything. We'll be getting rich today. What are you doing here? Well, I'm uh, very much an amateur uh, gold panner. Throw some sand in there. Immediately we can take out the big ones. Swash out all that silt. It's metal and it's, it's much heavier compared to most of the rocks we'll be finding in here. So the idea being that the gold will sink to the bottom of the pan. From what I understand, when you're looking for gold, you're looking for little shiny gold card things, but that aren't uh, really jagged. You want them to be more rounded. So you can see here, that's muscovite, which definitely has a lot of shine. It's really thin too, so if I were to put it on its side, it can almost be like paper thin. But uh, definitely confusing when you're looking for shiny things. As of yet, not much luck. But it's you got, a, you got a couple of pieces. Got a couple of pieces, tiny, tiny, tiny little ones. So it feels good. I know it's there, but I'm, I'm really, I'm really holding out for that big, that that nugget that I can pick up between my two fingers. Um, but uh, at a minimum, I'm learning a lot more about just all the rocks that are going on. Storm's fast approaching, but we found this route that got us up maybe about a kilometer so far, but we think it's not gonna last long because the river gets steeper up ahead. We got up about a kilometer, a kilometer and a half, but the river gets a little more steep, so we gotta start portaging. The best option would be to portage two kilometers to the next body of water, and then, uh, and then from there we can paddle about 2k, and then it would be a 750 meter portage to the next that body of water that we scoped earlier. Now the real question, though, is do we do this portage right now or do we hunker down? This storm is looking ugly, and it's definitely headed our way. It's a big wall. I think we hunker down. Yeah. Do this in the morning. Yeah. So it appears the wind has shifted directions on us. It was pretty calm here not too long ago. No wind whatsoever. And now there's like a decent gust going on. We have a pretty good setup going on right now at camp. We've got kind of a, an area set up with a tarp under the canoes with less metal use over there. And then we've got our tent set up uh, behind me here. It has quite a few metal poles. We may avoid going into that, but just to have a zone that's dry and, and we can throw some stuff into. So nothing makes you feel more vulnerable than uh, being out here in the barrens when a lightning storm's coming through. 
The other thing about being out here in the Barrens is that there's nothing to protect you from high winds. So when the winds are ripping, they just rip over these completely bald hills and you just, you take the full force. So we've secured the tent down with some big boulders, some uh, guidelines. We're hoping that that's enough to keep the tent in place. We've pegged it the best we can, but I mean, you can only peg so well in, in this kind of gravelly stuff. So we'll see how it goes. We're doing Thanksgiving dinner. Instant mashed potatoes, instant stuffing, cranberries, vegetable mix from Bulk Barn, some bacon bits with real bacon, and then on top of that, we'll add a bunch of gravy. Oh, thank you, Noah. Thank wow. you. I originally started with one pack of potato and one pack of stuffing, but we doubled it up with two and two. It's the way to go, for sure. We're pretty hungry. Mmm. Really good. There's something wrong with my stove. It's just not being pressurized after pumping it like 30 to 60 times. I do have a repair kit, but I think this morning I'm just gonna use Kyle's stove. I had a terrible sleep. I have a inflatable mattress that um, doesn't inflate. Doesn't inflate. I mean, it inflates great, but I think the nozzle it's slightly broken, so uh, I probably get maybe a couple hours of air out of it. It was a long sleep of rolling around on sharp, pointy rocks. A deep tissue massage, cool. you know? You just need to get strategic with tent placement now. Last night we got off the river a little earlier than normal, probably about four o'clock, because we saw that storm coming in. So we battened down the hatches, but it turned out we didn't even get hit with it. But a week ago we got hit really badly, so that's still is we still feel that one. So we didn't want to take any chances, so we got off early. But the site we have here is beautiful. The river doesn't have much water though. And that sort of leads us up to today's activities. We got to a section where it's too steep to continue tracking. So we need to portage at least two kilometers to get around this section. We know today there's gonna to be a lot of portaging and a lot of getting in and out of the boats. So because of that, we're gonna be doing a two chocolate bar day. That's right, the first of the trip. Hopefully that gives us enough fuel and energy to get through today's activities. And I'm sure it will. We're all in good spirit. The terrain's very easy to portage and we're getting very close to Contoido Lake. We got a brief little section of paddling this morning after our first portage. Now the river's choked up again. We're back on our feet, got another portage, but we're getting close. We're doing well, we're pushing distance. We're doing kind of a shortcut route to a side lake, hoping that this lake might have more water than the river does, and then connecting back with the river. So we're doing a quick hop off the river, hop back on the river, hoping that we can actually paddle some of that distance rather than the, the bony rivers that we've been seeing as we get closer to Contoida Lake. Welcome back to another episode of the Portage Chronicles. Here with your host, Alex Trainer. And we're out here and we're just portaging. It's tricky walking again. Classic on the rocks. But these rocks actually are holding their place a little bit better. The one thing that I've learned, Northwest Territories and Nineveh is home to some of the most loose rocks around. Do I trust a rock? No, I don't trust a rock. I never trust a rock. Now, this has been some of the best portage country we've been going through. The stuff right here, she's dry. So there's no, no bogs trying to eat your shoes. 
to do things like that. So this ain't so bad. This ain't so bad. We've made it to the lake. And it actually looks paddleable. Are you trolling and get some cats out? A little set by Josephine. There we go. It's a small one. Oh my god, it's a largemouth bass. Really tiny trout. It's actually not that tiny though. It is huge! <laughs> oh my god, it's massive! Oh, did you see it? I saw it. It was enormous. I don't know how enormous. I guess it's around 30. I don't know. You, you thought the 35 incher was 25 inches. Yeah, I saw it from like, it was deep and enormous. Yeah, you never want to say you have a big fish until you've got, until you got it in your hands, you know? Let's try my first surface here. Quick update, the play now is to paddle slowly to shore to try to land this thing. You see it? He's right down there in the middle. Going in for it. Yeah, you got him, you got him. Oh, oh. My <laughs> oh my god. Let's measure him up quick. No, but he's girthy as heck. He's a 30. 30 and a half. Well fought, man. The best fought I've had this whole trip. Oh. Everyone is on right now. Nice fish. So we just caught two nice eating size grayling. We haven't had grayling yet on the trip, but we're gonna eat these tonight. It's a really nice white flaky flesh if you live on the East Coast, like a haddock. And so there's two ways to eat them. We can fillet them like we normally would, or you gut them and then stuff the cavity with like butter and maybe some herbs and then just do them whole in the pan. So, uh, and then, yeah, descale them. So, chef! I don't know what our chef wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you need to know about grayling is that the meat doesn't keep well. Like trout, you could catch it middle of the day and eat it late in the evening. But the grayling meat tends to spoil pretty quick, so. It's 3.30 now, we'll be fine, to, fine for dinner. Like, I caught a grayling a couple weeks ago around noon and had it for dinner, but you gotta keep it cold. You don't wanna let it linger all day. Paddled out around the Esker, thinking there might be a beach. And we got a beach. Always a pleasant surprise when you get a beach. Friggin' 
paradise right here. Look at this tent spot. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah, it's such a narrow ridge. Kevin was explaining these things to us. Was he? And he said that this is where they dried skins. Man, this is so old. Yeah. What a spot for it too, eh? Yeah. We just got to camp for the night and there is this really, really long escort behind us. We just climbed it and there are spectacular views here. But what's even cooler is there's an old tent ring here and you could see that from this ring of rocks. And this would have been used by the Inuit way back in the day to set up their tent, which they would have dried hides in. This is archeologically really, really cool and quite significant too. This is very special that we're here right now. Beautiful weather, amazing esker, a rock ring that is God knows how old, and the bugs aren't even that bad. These are the nights that make it all worth it. Another day in paradise. It is the morning of day 25. The second half of this trip has just been absolutely flying by. There's not much you can do to slow them down other than just constantly remind yourself to just be present, be in the moment, and, and enjoy yourself out here. We're at a beautiful campsite here, probably one of our favorites of the trip. Good campsites not only about the features that are there or how cool the site is, but it's, it's actually also about the experience you get. Having sun last night and sun this morning, you know, no breeze, no bugs, all of those things definitely add up and uh, are making this one hell of an experience right now. So I'm just getting breakfast ready for the guys right now and then uh, we'll get them up shortly here. Breakfast is ready, coffee is hot, my tin whistle playing needs some work. The goal today is going to be to paddle Pellet Lake and it's gonna be nice just to have a paddling day. No portages. The wind's been picking up all day. This morning we paddled about 10 kilometers and it took all morning to do it. Doesn't seem like it's gonna let up anytime soon. So we just pulled over in this leeward bay, had some lunch and trying to figure out the next moves. It's all white cappy, like the lake looks nasty. And then maybe get in behind this little nub by the river and see if there's a good place to, good place to post up in behind there. And, just chill. The winds are supposed to subside through the afternoon. Ooh. I like the now or never though, like I think we gotta move. Did yeah. you get your last wrap? Sure did. Yeah. You, you just ate it? Just raw dogged it. <laughs> yeah. We're just having lunch and in the distance we saw this weird vertical mass. There's no trees around. We got the binoculars out and we saw this structure I'm gonna go check it out. March 2004. I'm gonna say 2004 based yeah, on the calendar. Family pick maybe? We seem to have run into an old abandoned camp that probably we think might not have been used since 2003 or at least that's the 
calendar datings that we've got in here. We don't see anything else that shows signs of anything more recent than that. The front has been torn in pretty bad, but like this, this room's actually preserved pretty well. Like to just think that this place would have potentially just been sitting empty for that many years. It's like 20 years, pretty much. Really cool spot, but we will not be staying here. It looks very run down and it sort of smells bad. We're gonna go find some shelter somewhere and probably set up camp for the day because this wind and rain doesn't look like it's gonna let up. What's up? We got a sweet chill zone for these howling winds. It stopped raining for a second. Let's get some tents set up here, hunker down, and really just uh, get the vibe going, you know? This club's open for business. Those are crowberries. They're the worst berry out here. All it is is skin and seed, but it's one of the main berry sources for the grizzly bears here. I spent a lot of time looking at the ground here, whether it be on portages, walking around, or just examining stuff. And there's things you always see on the ground of the barren lands. Always a sort of berry down here. Animal poop or animal bones. Guarantee, it's always here. Let's try a sample size right below my feet. What do we got? Poop. Crowberry. And a different type of berry. There's room for one more right Is that the last of our whiskey? Yeah, what we're staring at here is the last of the whiskey. We saved the best for last. We hauled this thing over Pike's Portage. Yeah. And many more potages and then dragged it down the back river. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then up the control <laughs> them. Or the poor gets last choice of I think it needs it out of this one. This one has the more. Do those look more or less even to you know? Cheers! Cheers. The last of the whiskey. <laughs> I feel like we actually did, we still did the gateway to the Arctic, I think. I still think so. For sure, we just ran out of time. Yeah. We, also, we also really experienced the Arctic, how much ice we had. Yeah. And, and happy, all the hard work. I'm happy we stuck with the plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so am I. There's a lot after after that confluence that was just like really cool area that we've traveled And we through. just changed our whole mindset. We slowed down and just started having fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's easier to do sh shitty shit when you're a bit slower. You just chip away at it. Every spot has a place at this point in the trip. Most days when we're paddling, we're often scanning the shorelines looking for subtle change in color or movement that could be wildlife. This morning, Graham noticed a cluster of brown objects far in the distance. At first, we couldn't make out what they were, but as we drew nearer, the graceful forms of these animals became clearer. What we were witnessing was the Bathurst caribou herd, a highly endangered barren ground caribou whose population has declined by 98% in the last 40 years. Today, less than 7,000 caribou remain. Barren ground caribou have been documented to migrate over 3,000 kilometers each year, which is known as the longest migration of all land animals. This was a pretty special experience that we just got seeing that herd of caribou that's actually scattered 
across multiple different ridge lines. We don't think we're done seeing them yet. We're gonna continue paddling on down the lake and we think we may even come across more. I had the binoculars out and on these two ridges counted 52 and then we realized afterwards that the whole other side of the lake um, has a bunch of caribou. I didn't count those, but I would say probably around the same. So I'm within view, there's at least 100, I would say, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. He seems very confused. What's that? He seems confused. Yeah. So there's a young moose in the water right beside us right now. He looks very curious to what we might be. Moose don't actually live up in the Barren Lands, but they come up here to escape forest fires down south. And this moose is really far away from that tree line. And it's interesting that he's so close to the caribou herd, he might just feel a little lost. He's looking for a companion out here. So uh, what we can see here is we're actually on the world's flattest esker. It's a really strange phenomenon. It's almost like you could drive a car on it. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> it's actually a nice route. There's a mine uh, called Lupin Mine. I think it may be inactive now. The, they would call this the portage because the road goes into the lake and then that portion, the lake portion would be on ice. And this road goes, about, I think about 600 kilometers to Yellowknife and all of the mining equipment would be brought in in kind of between February and March, maybe January, February, March, by a uh, truck on the ice road. And all of the provisions for the whole year, so all of the fuel that the mine uses and the building materials and the mining equipment all go in during that two, two or three month period. Tortillas? Here we go. What's the menu today, Kyle? Same thing that's on the menu every day. We used to have jam, but we're out of jam. So just tortillas and peanut butter and trail mix. Some people put the trail mix in the wrap. I don't like to do that. Some people put everything in the wrap. Noah, you put everything in the wrap. <laughs> I do put everything in the wrap. <laughs> Ooh, that's a, good, that's a good amount. It's your favorite. This guy's looking a little small. This one's looking small, I'd say now. Hey, we're gonna rotate the thing, Graham. You have to close your eyes, bro. <laughs> close my eyes. Hey, hey sweetie. <laughs> Come here, cutie. So we just had an amazing final paddle up Pellet Lake here just after lunch today. Beautiful barren landscapes. There's caribou kind of running along the shorelines the entire paddle up. And we just made it to the final river connection between Pellet Lake and Contoido Lake um, where we were hoping to be able to track our canoes but at first glance here, it's looking very bony and looking like it might be one final portage for the team here. Just absolutely beautiful out here and I don't think anything can phase us at this point. Not much water going on in there. Contoido Lake is 100 kilometers long and this is the outflow. And you'd think there'd be a lot of water coming out of it. We're probably looking at about a 2K portage, but personally, I'm like, okay, well, this is probably a track because of the size, so I wasn't mentally prepared for this. So I'm gonna need a moment to like get back into portage mode. Same old sound Find a 
highs on Contoido Lake. Highs on Contoido. Pretty stoked. This is a, it's a big moment for us. We made it, boys. I've been hiking for a month and I made it! I made it! I can try to learn! I made it! Woo! Looking good. There's definitely some strong winds over a large section of water at the south end of Kentoido Lake. We've got about a kilometer and a half to reach where we want to camp, where we'll be fully exposed to the big side of the lake. I feel like we all feel pretty well seasoned at this point. Probably about 700 meters, 700 meter crossing, so we won't have necessarily shoreline beside us. We just did a big paddle just so that we could make it to what we assumed would be a really cool area to camp, which is this island behind me here. And uh, we're just about to go check it out right now to see if we can find a leeward side. It'd be a stove of some sort. I wonder if it washed up or if it was actually from here. Mm. file in the middle. That's pretty cool. Cloudberries for dinner. Oh man. Look at this patch. This is the patch. Remember Noah you were like we're gonna hit a patch. We talked about an epic patch that would all be ripe at the same time and this is the patch. There is a full field of ripe cloudberries here. You want one bite on those or? No, no, I'm gonna savor these. Morning guys. It's a little later than we usually get up, but the wind has been howling all morning and all night. We're not going anywhere until this subsides a bit. We checked a weather report and tonight it's supposed to die a bit, where we will make the final push to the final campsite where we'll be extracted in a couple days. I was very impressed with this tent. It was shaking violently all night and it's still in great condition. Again, this is a four season Marmot Thor for three people. I think Alex and I can both agree that this has been a, a great investment for this trip. I agree. <laughs> I don't know if a plane could land in this right now.
real windy and cold out here. It's eight degrees, but feels like four degrees. And that's a big jump from the earlier days where it felt like 30 degrees. You really get a sense that summer is dwindling up here already. And it's just pretty much the beginning of August. The wind's gone down a bit, but not enough to paddle. It's looking like now we'll be doing a night paddle. Wind is typically lighter in the night and stronger during the day. And this is because of the relationship between the jet streams in the atmosphere and how hot the earth is. Wind is generated by the mixing of air. And when the earth is warmer, it's creating more of a polarity between the cooler jet streams, creating more turbulence, thus creating more winds. But at night, when the earth cools down, there's less turbulence and there's more laminar flow. And that results in less wind. So we're gonna be taking advantage of that tonight. Do this final 20K. Just about nine o'clock here. And in the last two to four hours, the wind has really died down and there's no longer white caps out there. It looks like a strong wind tomorrow too. So we're trying to take advantage of this window in the night. It's very weird right now to be packing up camp at 9.30 at night, getting ready to set sail on the water for the day. And the sun is still shining, very bright. It's a... Uh, this is gonna be a new one for us. We haven't uh, experienced anything like this before and looking forward to paddling, hopefully with light most of the night. I'm generally not a night guy, so the hardest part of this paddle tonight is not falling asleep out there. We're gonna have a lot of coffee to start this trip and also some sour gummies and chocolate to keep me occupied as we paddle through midnight tonight. Yeah. It is one o'clock in the morning on July 30th, 2022. We're on Contoido Lake in Nunavut. And this is the lighting right now. Final campsite where we're getting picked up by Air Tindy two days from now. Or I guess tomorrow at this point because it's about two in the morning. This is about as dark as it's going to get and from here it's only going to get lighter. The wind started picking up at the very end of our paddle so we timed this absolutely perfectly. And uh, it was a special paddle across the lake.
Well, tonight's the final night of the trip. I'm getting picked up tomorrow. And I uh, went and got some blueberries, some wild blueberries, and made a blueberry sauce uh, with some leftover brown sugar we had. And then I came down and I was like, man, well, we should put the bannock and make a little blueberry um, cobbler. And then Noah just materialized this amazing chocolate cake mix. So we're gonna do, for the last night, some kind of uh, chocolate cake with a blueberry topping. On Rio Man. What do we give her? In 15 minutes? I don't know. Look at hot in there. Steam and stuff. It's a big moment. Oh, oh my god! Oh. Holy! No Look at that! <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Still looks good. You know, I think I think the patience is the game, guys. I think we need to go back to the drawing board and wait, because it'll be amazing if we wait. Part of it is cooked. Oh man, that looks like a perfect combo. Yeah, looks pretty awesome. Oh, <laughs> Speak to it. Hey there, little guy. <laughs> You've really done well. Um, so here we have the yolk. Um, you hardly know. It's a you hardly know. I mean, yolk. it was a broken yolk, and uh, we sacrificed my paddle. And believe it or not, 20 days later, more or less, still here, and it got us over a lot more portages. So I would say mission accomplished on uh, the yolk. We're getting very close to the end of the trip here. This is the time that you start to think about all the great things that you got out of the trip. You start to look forward to some of the comforts back home. I find these trips really give you an appreciation for how easy we have things in our normal day-to-day -day lives. Even a, a task as simple as getting water for coffee or making a coffee, it's kind of like a humbling thing that you know, it makes you appreciate it more when you go back to it. The pace really dropped off a ledge once we realized we weren't making it to Bathurst Inlet. The delays that we had were enough to make it unrealistic. Bathurst Inlet was definitely the goal, but a bigger part for me is just traveling through the land. It's not necessarily for the destination. I really do love working hard 10, 12 hours a day and moving through these areas and seeing new things every day. And I've learned over the last week or so, when our pace has really dropped off a ledge, how important that is for me. With time comes change. And that's like a very cliche thing to say, but something that I'm really feeling right now. Whether you're pushing through a storm, whether you're dealing with bad bugs, the fact that these trips force you to deal with these things, but also teach you a lesson in doing so. We're just getting ready. The plane should be here any minute. <laughs> and there it is. I was hoping the plane was gonna take a little longer. I'm trying to just uh, enjoy it, final couple seconds here, and uh, before we take the flight out. It's about the journey, not the destination. And this is a philosophical conundrum our team really struggled with out here. This has become a bit of a tradition. Cheers. Cheers, boys. This is such a beautiful place, and we were so lucky to be able to spend a month out here. 
the landscapes, fishing and wildlife make the Barren Lands one of the most special places I've ever visited. A big part of me wants to stay out here and keep working our way to Bathurst Inlet. But I know our story isn't done and we'll be back to finish what we started. Oh, <laughs> 